It's time for Windows Weekly 137 with Paul Therott. It's our special year-end or year-beginning episode, depending on when you're listening to it. Paul's going to look back at 2009 and at the decade and look ahead to see what's up in 2010 for Microsoft. Our very special Windows Weekly is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott, episode 137 for January 1st, 2010. Stick a fork in it, it's done. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, visit audible.com slash windows and follow Audible on Twitter at audible underscore com. And by Astaro Corporation, makers of the Astaro Security Gateway, the best unified threat management device in the market. Call 877 the number 4 Astaro to schedule a free trial in your business. And by the new voice activated sync featuring hands-free calling, music and podcast search, and turn-by-turn -turn navigation. Available exclusively on Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury vehicles. For more details, visit SyncMyRide.com. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers all things Microsoft, including Windows, of course, the Zoom, the Microsoft keyboard. As one might expect from the name of the podcast. <laughs> it's Windows and more. And there he is, ladies and gentlemen, our uh, our Windows Maven, the uh, editor in chief of the super site for Windows, WinSuperSite.com, author of Windows Seven Secrets and Windows Vista Secrets. Was there a Windows XP Secrets? Not by me. No, that's actually what kicked this off. They asked me if I would do it, and you said and no. I said no because I, I wanted to do it right, and they wanted it done very quickly. Um. And, and then you they said if Windows XP is going to shed its secrets, it's going to take some time. Yeah. And they Found came back later and said, you were right. This book's terrible. Do you want to do the second edition? <laughs> and I said, no, I still don't want to do this. <laughs> you know? But I do want to do the next one. You fought and them. Off, off we went. You're, you fought them. And then, and then you yeah. were at the races. And now you're going to be doing that for the rest of your life. I was going to say, now I'm stuck in a quagmire. of sorts. stuck. Yeah. Hey, you know, think, of Vietnam. think on the bright side, every, um, every few months I get an envelope from Pearson. Yep. Oh, yeah, I do too. In that and envelope. It just has a piece of paper. It has a piece of paper that says you didn't yeah. make nothing. Actually, oh, no. I just <laughs> do you have yours? I was going to say yeah. I could show you one. Yeah, it's a big blue. I just, op I just opened one today. Yeah, I open each one just, you know, because yeah. hope springs eternal. My, mine, mine is for, um, uh, let's see if I can think of the name of the title. <laughs> Some Visual interdev, interdev Unleashed. Oh, I bet that's a... You know, that's a, like one of those books that's a, a, a per perennial seller. I'm sorry, I couldn't even I say it. I have no idea how much it sells every year. Visual Interdev lives. <laughs> it um, does, well, it does, actually. I use the successor to Windows... I'm sorry, to Visual Interdev. Wait a minute, don't tell um, me what the successor is. I, I, I'm, let me think. What could that be? Outlook? No. Uh, Word, no. PowerPoint, no. The successor to Visual Interdev. Oh, I know. Access? Wow. No, Visual Studio. Oh. And it's, if you want to look at it from a sort of a standalone app standpoint, um, uh, they call it, um, wow, what do they call it? Visual Web oh, yeah, Developer. The, yeah. But they the used... reason to use that tool back then for me was that it had an excellent code editor. And that editor is now the, you know, it's the Visual Studio editor. So you can run Visual Studio 2010 in a web developer mode, uh, which is very much the you know the latest version of Visual Studio. Yeah, it lives. It does live. Your book is completely irrelevant, but it lives. And you have no idea. <laughs> Although oddly enough, oddly enough, uh, in this book, I'd have to go look at it, but I'm sure what's in there is some of the ASP stuff, the original ASP oh, stuff, uh, the server side code for accessing database and all that stuff, and uh, that in many ways, lives on, sadly, in at least one of my sites. Uh, I can't seem to get rid of it, <laughs> you know, but I keep trying, so maybe someday. Well, I, had, I wrote uh, 13 books for Q in the Leoville Press <laughs> series. Um, nice. And occasionally, I always open those envelopes because, it, and you know, you, you, you know, because you get still, that. Envelope. Are they still around? Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. they're part of Pearson, so 
Uh, and yeah, what what isn't? What yeah. isn't? Uh, even Harry Potter's part of Pearson. Sure. So I, um, the first twelve pages are just you know excuses why they're not going to give me any money. But if they are going to give me any money, then it'll be on the last page. So what I do yes, is I always go to the last page. I throw out the top. I don't care. And just see if yep. there's a check at the bottom. If there isn't, I recycle the whole thing. And there it never is. There never is. Well, I don't know. Maybe for you there is. Not I got me. a check. No, I got a check for 250 bucks like two months ago. I don't know why. Nice. Nice. <laughs> yeah, the books I have that go through Pearson are older now for the most part. Well, this covers uh, 2003 and up. The last one was 2006, I think. Maybe 2005. So it wasn't, mm -hmm. you know... It's not. It's only. It's been a while. I don't know where that money came from. Uh, it, sure. I, it doesn't make any sense. It's, but did somebody sell one of these? <laughs> yeah, so one copy in what New happened? Zealand. It must have been something that they uh, sold a long time ago. Never accounted mm -hmm. for. Maybe it added up over time, or yeah, it was fifty cents at a time. For, I know they won't send a check unless it's what right. twenty-five bucks or. Oh, that explains it. Which That's probably that. what's in the first 13 pages. You'd be getting yeah. a check right now, but it's only for three cents. The, 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 you're right. And the accounting for which must have cost more than $25. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I never understand that. They spend so much money. Well, they have to do that. I know that. We do that. You know, we send you a 14 or 15 page statement every check, right? <laughs> yeah. Actually, you send me something better, which is just a check. Actual money. Just you don't so have to dig through it. <laughs> no, there's no digging. It's just there's we no don't explain digging. where this money comes from. We just send I, it. I'm to surprised you. there isn't blood on the check for me cutting my fingers from <laughs> chashing it so quickly. You know. <laughs> or or blood from me sweating on it as I sign. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Happy New Year. It's great. This is, we're winding up uh, 2000. We're as we record this. Now, this this show will appear on the first day of uh, uh, 2010. Mm -hmm. And and by the way, we did last week, we did the uh, the Decade Ender twit. And I yep. knew this would happen. I even started the show saying, I know technically the decade ends in 2010, but no one... true? Yes, yeah. it's the, la it's, was, yes, it's yes, the yes, same yes. thing with Y2K. The, but no one thinks of it that way. It's an odometer thing. When it clicks yeah. to 10, that's a new yep. decade. That's the teens. It was the aughts. And yeah. even though I said that, and even though I said I just prefer oh. to do it this way because I know I'll get a lot of mail if I do it. The, if I didn't do my decade ender till December 31st, you know, listen, 2010, I'd get even more. guarantee the mail. You were going to get it anyway, but now you've guaranteed it. I've been in Twitter. I'll, they're I'll raking me example. over the coals. I'll give you an example. A couple weeks ago on the podcast, you remember this, I talked about AMD and Intel. And I said, you know, I know people aren't going to like this and they're going to write me email. I just don't like AMD stuff. Oh, oh. Right? And I said, please don't. Don't it's write like me. It's like you're chumming it. the water there. Yeah, I know. I, I know I'm going to get email when I write that PC gaming is doomed. I know I am. You know, but what are you going to do? <laughs> Ooh, that one's a good you one. Can, you can tell people explicitly, please don't write me. I get it. I know. Ryan, I know Ryan, I, Shrout, I Ryan Shrout of uh, a PC Perspective, who does our Twitch podcast, really wants to do a joint show with you, a debate yeah. about a the, debate. Poop, yeah, PC gaming, a dead or alive. Okay. Well, and, okay, I, I'm. I, look, I'd be happy to do it. I mean, I just. But I think you know me well enough to know I feel pretty ambivalent about it. I mean, I, I, as strongly as he probably feels that I'm wrong. Eh, I don't really care. There's no proof of it. <laughs> the, the, all the, all the, you know, if you're going to talk about facts, all the facts are yeah. it's dead. Yeah. If right. you're going to talk about emotions, still, but, but for the people who still do it, it's never going to be dead for them. It's never going to be dead, really. No. It's just not what it was. I mean, I would say there are people for whom Elvis uh, is not dead. You know, 10 years ago or more, 20 years ago, well, 15 years ago, whatever, um, there's no doubt that the PC was the not not just the, the premium gaming platform, but the what I would call the sort of, um, you know, the mainstream gaming platform. You know, the PlayStation 2 or um, before the original Xbox or whatever those standalone video game machines were, you know, didn't really cut it. You know, and we didn't have the web stuff that we have now. We didn't have excellent handheld games, um, other avenues for entertainment. That take our minds off of, you know, no. standard video games. We so, barely had TV. Yeah, we, that's right. We were still using A-Track tapes. Yeah. It was uh, it yeah. was a different age. A different and time. things were steam-powered. But, you know, uh, things change, that's all. And, um, no, I, I think there'll always be people who... We've already talked about this. So, <laughs> it doesn't matter. I, you know... You just, um, well, the point is, you're going to get the mail. You say something like that, Okay, you're yeah. going to get the mail. Yeah. You say it's the end of and the if, decade, if this guy, you're going to get the mail. Was it Ryan or... Uh, Who'd you say? Ryan who Shroud wants to do this. Ryan, yeah. Who is this, so, who is this guy? Who is this clown? Uh, no. Um, I would be... 
<laughs> I would no. I'm actually, I'm sure I've seen uh, the end of. He does the hardware podcast. Yeah, he hardware. does Twitch. Yeah, so I'd be happy to talk about it with him. Um, he's a he's a great guy. I don't know what. I don't I'm just going to roll I think over. It's, I could. I think it's more just an interesting conversation. Right. I don't right. think he really wants to, to debate about you. Certainly, That's probably not fair. I now have a lot of fuel because I've gotten. <laughs> All the hate so much email about this topic. They're actually piling the, I know the woods. About it than they're, I they're, they're piling the, the gasoline cans and wood beneath you. So you'll have plenty of fuel. Yes. As long just as no one lights a match. I don't have much time left. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> quickly. If we could just roll it along. <laughs> Let's move, move it along. <laughs> We've got a couple of big announcements. Uh, uh, some, some, uh, I don't know some, they are, well, yeah. they're, you know, people, people are very interested yeah. in you, Paul, and everything you do. <laughs> That's what I'm told. Yes. And that's apparently what I tell other people. Announcement numero uno. So, you know, I was on Twitter a few weeks back with Jerry Purnell. And Jerry's great a guy show, that I see show. from time to time at yeah. trade shows and all yeah. that. And I always inquire about him. I see Jerry's son these days, Alex, a lot more than I see Jerry. But, um, you know, he went through some health issues and stuff. And so he's a guy, I think about the guy a lot. And I grew up reading his stuff in Byte Magazine, but also his science fiction books. And I, I have, like I said, a collection of Byte magazines uh, in many boxes down in my cellar. And I have old Jerry Purnell computer books. And uh, doing all this stuff with uh, Jerry Purnell recently, I began revisiting all this stuff. And, you know, this, <laughs> this is thing that has always been an issue for me uh, in my professional life in that I get all this email from people. And a lot of it is uh, questions. You know, how, how do I fix this problem? I can't get this to work. This is what's wrong, this kind of thing. And I answer a lot of this email. Uh, sometimes people send me information that I don't have, right? And some of that stuff turns into tips or software picks or whatever that we do now on the podcast. But I've never really had an effective way uh, when I've answered a question for somebody to broadcast that to a lot of people. And I guess there are different ways to doing this, but people who follow my website may remember that for a time I was recommending that people contact me on Twitter first rather than via email. The thought being that if somebody asks me a question on Twitter, I can answer it in a in a group setting, and then if there are other people out there who can comment on it or add more information or correct me if I'm wrong or whatever, there's an opportunity to help more than one person. And that's kind of always been the goal. Um, the problem is I can't really live on Twitter, and Twitter is an, an up or down thing for me. There's sometimes that I'm on Twitter fairly frequently, and then there are other times when I'm not because I'm busy or whatever. And uh, Twitter just isn't working out as a good means for me to do this kind of thing that I want to do. So the way Jerry Purnell handled this, and I'm talking like 30 years ago, by the way, is that he would publish, at first in Byte Magazine, letters he got from readers. And by the way, letters literally in the mail, like yeah, paper letters, yeah, That's right? how old this is, yeah. Yeah, that's how they came in. And I was reading these in his, um, in his books, which are uh, compilations of his early 1980s Byte Magazine articles. And then I, I went to his website, and you know the guy still does it, right? Of course, now these emails are coming in via... Uh, email. Oh, I'm sorry, these messages, uh, mails are coming in via email. And of course, Jerry being Jerry, he talks a lot about uh, scientific topics and uh, non-computer industry topics and all that stuff. And I don't want to get off into that because I know nobody cares about my political views or whatever. But it occurred to me I should do something like this. And so here, you know, 15 years after the fact, um, I've created a, a mailbag section on my website. And I just want people to be aware of it because now every Sunday... What I'll be doing is compiling the mail that I think makes sense for a lot of people and putting it up on, on the website. And that way people can uh, benefit from some of the interaction that I have with individuals that otherwise would have just been sort of lost, you know, to the... I think it's a great idea. We should do it. I should do it. Everybody should do it. Yeah. It's so obvious and dumb that I haven't yeah. been doing this. And I, I didn't want to make it part of the blog because the blog, as it is now, is on a, a different technology than the site. And it's eventually going to be all consolidated into something prettier. But I don't like the blog as it is now. I have no way to fix it. It's it's part of Pent, and they I just, I just can't touch it. So rather than put it in that stink hole that but the blog is, I'm gonna I just Jeez. make it part of the site. You're not happy with the blog, I take it. <laughs> I hate it. Well, I, I don't like things I can't control. So the, the blog stink looks ugly. Is my blog? <laughs> it's awful. Well, it's a success poll. So uh, I put it. Well, now I want to go see it. I I didn't really notice how bad it was. Is it the same uh, CMS that you're, the whole sh shebang no, is? Oh, no, the site is not on any kind of CMS. It's just ASP, but the, the blog is on community server. Oh. And supposedly all of this will be moving to .NET Nuke, but that was going to happen in May, Why June, July. Why can't you July. control your own blog? Because I don't, I just don't have access to that stuff. It's just the way it is. So, you know, I asked I'm them when I started I'm starting to feel a little this. sorry for you. I mean, that's kind of. Yeah. 
It just looks like a regular blonde. Right. It's terrible. That's my point. (laughs) So (laughs) anyway, I am not going to put it there. So you're not going to put it here. Right. Will you have a new button on the super site that says? Yeah. If you click on the logo at the top. Yeah. Go right to the um, front page. On on Sunday, when I post the second mailbag, Mm -hmm. there'll be a mail option at the top. Ah, So you see that it's very top links. Right here. What I use, Paul. Right before. I don't know. Somewhere somewhere in there. But it's in there. Good. I think that's a great idea. I think you should even run it higher. Make it the front page. Make it a, yeah. Well, if you, uh, there's a link on the left somewhere uh, on one of those color graphics. So I'll, I'll always have a graphic for it. Oh, so. there it is. I see. Super site mailbag with the, yeah, with so the Gmail logo, one. which is. Yeah, good. which is probably intellectual property theft. Eh, um, what the hell? What the hell? <laughs> which, you know, I'm, I'm actually quite fond of doing so. Yeah, it's okay. So this yeah, is, this is week, for instance, just, is PC Gaming Doom. You've done a, a quite a good job Yeah, here. so yeah. obviously that was the big topic du jour uh, right. the first week. I would expect most weeks are actually going to be smaller you know a bunch of smaller things this first week was just that was a lot of the mail so that's the way it worked out but it will i and i think i will evolve it over time we'll see how it goes but i will i will i already have a bunch of stuff for the second one and i i suspect based on how my email has gone for my entire life that i'll have no problem filling this thing up so well and you could do tweets you could do uh, i mean there's a there's an endless supply of feedback from uh from listeners right Right. I mean, uh, this comes in from all kinds of places. We, in fact, if you wanted to do this on like on a monthly basis, we could do a a, a call in uh, version of this show. Yeah, we should do that. I think it'd be really. Fun. I, I don't know why we don't do that. Let's plan on doing every say every fourth episode. Steve does it every other episode. Yeah, but I, I think how does that, he do it? Do people actually call in? No, he does not because he likes to research answers. So he has a okay. website. He has you know GRC. Yeah, I like to be wrong feedback. right off the cuff. Me too. I couldn't care less. You know, yeah, yeah. Just I, I just make it up as I'm going. Yeah. I will say this, you know, I've done a lot of public speaking and I've never, I, I've never done it well, I don't think. But the one thing I, I think I do do well in those situations is that Q&A part. Mm-hmm, you know, I, I really yeah. enjoy the impromptu mm-hmm. questions because people ask the craziest <laughs> questions sometimes. Well, but they and ask I what people are interested in. I, that's my favorite part of speaking too. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people are afraid of that kind of thing. I, to me, that's the only part I care about. It's funny, me too. And I, I almost feel like, well, I couldn't really take their money if I didn't give a speech i was but, in the hague i got kicked off the stage i wanted to sit there and just answer yeah, questions they're like no we got to wrap this thing up i'd almost want to just say no speech just let me do it. Let's, let's just you and yeah, me let's, let's just talk Q&A. yeah i would do more speeches if i could do that but people think they pay me money that should you know do sure, some actually work. do some work yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know where they got that idea they obviously haven't watched my shows <laughs> just like pour a bottle of wine sit down and be like fire away let's let's, <laughs> let's what, talk what do you get what do you got? But it's less hierarchical, and I, that's what I kind of prefer. I mean, uh, you and I yeah. both know it, it's not the Sermon from the Mount. We're not, you know, no, handing down no, the tablets. No, 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 no. This is a conversation that's an ongoing conversation. Right. That's exactly right. Announcement number two. So I've gotten a lot of questions. You know, I, I occasionally do these Everything Must Go events where I give away or sell electronics and books and, you know, other things that have been piling up here. Because, you know, one of the things that occurs... Uh, with me and as with you, you know, uh, you make X amount of dollars and then you spend X amount of dollars minus 10 to buy all this stuff so you can write about it and review it and all that stuff. That's and right. I don't keep all of it. And uh, if I did pay for it, I, I sell it for very cheaply. If I didn't pay for it, I'd give it away. And I am, go- I am prep, uh, prep, 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 prepping. Um, or preparing, one might say. You sounded, you sounded like a little motorcycle there. I was going to say, I Those, know, I, I tried scooters. to drag it out a little longer than usual, but I was going to, it was a combination of prepping and preparing, which I couldn't quite Prepping. Um, some stuff. So I'll have some copies of the books, oh. uh, my book, to are give you, away. Are you and, saying that it's time for another Everything Must Go? Yes. I and need to get an echo. Yeah, that was no, it was, it was good. Where can I get so, an echo? The only thing is, I don't. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, in keeping with our previous conversation, please do not write me and ask me what I'll be. Uh, everything must <laughs> go. Or giving away. Everything, and don't ask for everything stuff. must go. That's so, uh, I can't also say when it's going to be exactly because I'm some of my travel stuff is up in the air. But I want to say sometime between January and February. Yes. When I have at least a few weeks home, because yes. I need, I really need time to handle all of the the email and correspondence and all that stuff that occurs when I do this. It's a big deal. So I, as I know, I will let you know, and I'll, I'll do that on the podcast and we'll do it again. Yay. That's one of my favorite things. I love that. Yeah. That's, this is when I got my copy of uh, Lotus Symphony. 
That's right. <laughs> That's right. How is that doing, by it's the way? Wonderful. I uh, yeah. we're, we're actually uh, running the whole business on it. You know, I almost recommended an Audible book this week that was. Uh, I wish I could remember the name of it. It was. It, it was about getting rid of stuff, uh, and because this is sort of that doing more with less type of philosophy that I am trying to adhere to. It's an ongoing battle, and you know, I'm trying to divulge myself of all this junk, especially stuff that I don't use. And I don't mean junk like it's junk, but it's. You know, if it's in your house and you're not using it, what's the point? I mean, it's just sitting there. Someone else could get derive value from this. They might as well have it. Um, but the book was so stilted, you know, in the reading of it. It was just awful. I mean, I, I, I wanted so badly to be able to recommend a book of this kind, but it was just so terrible I couldn't do it. <laughs> well, then I'm glad you didn't. I wanted to. <laughs> I'm just glad you didn't. I think <laughs> that then that's... I realized I'm not here to punish people. No, I think that's a good, uh, pretty good philosophy. I can go with that. <laughs> yeah. This is not supposed it's just, to be painful. Uh, it's just how I live. You know? So we're going to do, you're going to do, a, this is a fun show because you're going to do a look back at 2009 and, and some of the big yep. stories. And then you're brave, some things to look mm -hmm. forward to in uh, 2010. Sure. So, uh, uh, you know, this is traditionally a slow news week, which is why you see all of those look back, look forward pieces by everybody. Yes. There's nothing to talk yes. about. Yes. I have to write news every morning. And I have to tell you, this week between <sighs> Christmas and New Year's, oh. Nobody's even at work. It's like getting blood from a stone. The news is, yeah. I ate 40 Christmas cookies and I'm going to yeah. throw up now. It's not good news. Let's put it that way. It is nothing. There's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs who are sitting uh, on, on, you know, in their living room surrounded by women's shoes, uh, counting backwards from 100 in Latin because they have nothing to do. Wow. That was quite a... <laughs> A description of what I don't know where people. that came from. <laughs> Speaking of the plot of a Guy Ritchie movie. Actually, uh, it, I do know where it came from. The, the okay. great first American chess champion, Paul Morphy, who was a, a okay. man from New Orleans and uh, was the greatest player in the world uh, in the 1850s. Eventually, as, as many world champions do, eventually went mad. And uh, was last seen sitting in his New Orleans apartment, surrounded in a circle, uh, sitting naked on the floor, surrounded in a circle by women's shoes. So, in fact, that image is exactly what popped in my mind. You know, I had a, a, a dream. I, I, <laughs> I hesitate to say about you, because I know how that sounds. But you were in the dream. And it was a kind of a Vegas thing. Was I playing chess? Was I wearing women's shoes? No. We, we are going to Vegas. Vegas, baby. We're going to Vegas, and uh, you're going to we be there, and I'm going to be there, line. and you and you and you were there. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, January 6th through 10th. We're going to be broadcasting live. We'll do Windows Weekly Live if you want to stop by. We're in the South Hall, and I think we're in a public area. <laughs> like the, the parking lot, actually. Um, Let me Wait a minute. Let me. No, 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 no. The South Hall the is South where, Hall. where all the home theater stuff is, I think. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask. Hold on a second. I'm going to okay. I'm going to do something you don't hear a lot in a podcast. I'm going to get up and walk oh, into the other room. Hey, okay. where is our uh, booth in the at CES? It's South Hall. South Hall. Kiki's telling me she S1. S1. We we are so good. We are in S1. We're basically by the, by the entrance. So you you don't have to have a ticket to get into CES to see us. Do you? You do. You do. Okay, never mind. Thank you. So there you have it. Kiki and Dane have told me that uh, we are in the South Hall, booth S1. You couldn't get a better S booth than S1. One. Wow. Or a worse booth. Is that by the bathroom or something? <laughs> it might be. It might be they you start know? counting from the rear. I don't know. That's actually how we're going to get listeners. We'll just be sitting there as people queue to go into the bathroom. <laughs> Lemon62 uh, or 2601, who's apparently new to our chat room, says, Leo sounds like he's sort of drunk but not drunk. Strange. And then uh, Hot Blue Alien, who apparently has been here before, says, ah, Leo always sounds like that. I don't know what to say to that. I actually am drunk. Because it's New Year's Eve. <laughs> I, I, I actually considered having a glass of something. But some then bubbly. it occurred to me, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which means it's to, 11 have, in the afternoon here. I need so to pace probably, myself today. Good. Um, so yeah, we're gonna uh, we're gonna be at the South Hall booth S one. I do believe that's at the entrance, but I, I and I had hoped that you could just like come and see us, but I guess you have to yeah. have a CES ticket. You do have a ticket, right? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. So you'll be able to see us, Paul. Yeah, I've, done this, I've done this before. I'm, <laughs> Paul, you're you not know. just gonna show up. 
Wait, you need a ticket? <laughs> I'm here. What is this event? What do you want? <laughs> hey, what's in there? Can I oh, go in man. there and look? There's, I just want to see. There's a lot see. of people here. I thought I'd what's, swing by. What's going on? You guys having a party? You ever fly to Vegas and you're on the, the plane with these people who are looking around them and wondering How did this what the happen? heck is yeah. going on? Yeah, who are these and people? Then, and then you realize, you know, then they suddenly realize they're going to Vegas on the worst possible weekend oh, of their lives. Yeah, they're, they're, are, they're realizing this is not a good thing. The, yeah. the, the other fun part is when you're leaving Vegas on a Sunday, yep. it's like a shift change. So yeah. all of the geeks are leaving, you know, and their shorts and their little thing. And then all the people in uh, short shorts and Hawaiian shirts, and they're yeah. already drunk, are on the plane, you know, getting. Yep. So, and it's like as you get to the airport. They're getting off the plane as you're getting on. And it's, it's like a shift change. They're looking forward to their life ahead. And, and everyone there is like death incarnate. <laughs> We're slow. Yeah. It's like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Slogging out. Yeah. Oh. So if you go to CESweb.org, you can get um, a, a wonderful map. Mm -hmm. It shows you just how massive. So if you were CES just a person, is. if you just wanted to go no, to CES, not allowed. Can't do how it. How much does that cost? You must be able to buy a. No, you have to be in the nope. trade. Really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So if you uh, look at the Vegas Convention Center, as if uh, this would be as if you are uh, approaching it from the front door, from the parking lot. Um, yep. There's the Hilton Hotel on your left, the Renaissance on your right, and in the middle is LVCC, the Las Vegas Convention Center. The far left hall is the North Hall. That's where the games, the cars, the tech zone will be. Oh, yeah. Central Hall is uh, home entertainment. It's iPod, home theater. I try to skip out on the North Hall as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah, North Hall is the car stereos. Yeah. South Hall, uh, cameras, uh, uh, home automation, Wi-Fi, that kind of three. That's S3. And then uh, yep. upstairs. This S3 is downstairs. S4 is upstairs. Uh, and then um, uh, home theater and audio, uh, S1, that's the downstairs South Hall is all the way to the right. Yep. So that's where we are. By, we're Silver Lots it's, 4. It's hard to tell on this map, but it's oh, there it is. It, it's about a, a mile and a half. This is a big from, distance. From the North Hall. It is a big place. Yeah, you don't want to walk. And we're staying at the Renaissance. Oh, I guess I probably shouldn't tell everybody. <laughs> but if you want to call me, I'll be in room 5311 at the Renaissance Las Vegas. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, so, <laughs> somewhere. You just hurt someone's weekend. Oh, dear. We'll be all, all of us, including all the beautiful women, we'll be staying at the Renaissance Las Vegas. So come on by and say hi. Nice. But that's nice because if you look at the map, we just we just fall out the door and, and we're right there. Yeah, there. One. yeah. Oh, is that right next door to that? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Very nice. So nice. Uh, I guess we're not in the lobby. I thought we might be in the S1 lobby. We're not in the lobby. We're actually inside S1. But I don't know what our booth number is. So we're in there. And uh, come come oh, by. This one is the section. I Paul see. Paul and I will yeah. be doing the show. What what did you say? One p.m. I think it's at ten thirty a.m. Oh, in the morning. Oh, good. Friday. Okay. I think. Yeah. That's no, I think that's topic. probably right. Yeah. Uh, so we'll be doing Windows Weekly from CES. We shall have some great CES uh, stuff to talk about. Oh, somebody's coming in. S one. Okay. S one. We're the booth is S one, and we're in S one. Oh wow! And wow. actually, we're on at ten a.m. We're on at ten a.m. So. Just rewind this podcast if you're at all confused, and it'll help. <laughs> Not one whit. <laughs> We're going to get to your stories, the big stories of 2009. Paul Therott in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to mention our great friends at Astaro Corporation. They make the Astaro Security Gateway, which is, uh, if you're in business, you know it's very important you protect your uh, end users from spam, viruses. Uh, you want to protect yourself from them misusing your computer uh, equipment and, and, and internet uh, access. Uh, and, and there is something called a UTM, a Unified Threat Management Box. It does all of this. Now, I have to admit, there are other companies that make them, but I can tell you the best, the one I use, the one we've recommended for years, the one all the experts say is the most robust, the most secure. It's Astaro, A-S-T-A-R-O, the Astaro Security Gateway. It, uh, they have a variety of sizes depending on how big your enterprise is. And in fact, as you grow, so does Astaro. You can actually uh, use 10 of these, as many as 10 security gateways in a, in a, a cluster to actually uh, you know, increase your availability as time goes by. Let me tell you some of the things it does. You've got SSL VPN. So you already have IPsec, of course, L2TP over IPsec. You've got PPTP tunneling, but you also have SSL, which makes it very easy to VPN in the boss like that. 
You've got the best of breed of open source and commercial software covering anti-spam, anti-phishing, dual virus protection for email, another virus, antivirus for the web, transparent encryption of all your email or digital signing using SMIME or OpenPGP, so your users don't have to even know they're using it, but you do. Of course, a, the state-of-the-art firewall uh, intrusion protection, I can go on and on, but the best thing to do is to try this out in your place of business free. Get a demo unit. Schedule a free trial of an Astaro Security Gateway in your appliance, appliance in your business by calling 877, the number 4, Astaro. That's toll free in the U.S. 1877, the number 4, A S T A R O. 1877, the number 4, Astaro. Outside the U.S., just surf to the website, Astaro.com. And non commercial users can try it free too. You can download it. They have a VMware appliance or download the software, put it on your own computer. Just find out more at astaro.com. We thank them so much for their support. This is a, Astaro was our very first sponsor, uh, starting on Security Now on the Twit Network. And uh, they've been with us for four years now. And uh, wow. yeah, I'm really proud to be a part of uh, the growing Astaro family. So, Paul Therott, uh, we didn't get to do this with you on Twit. I wish we had, but a look back at uh, the year. You could even, if you wanted, look back at the decade. What was the version of Windows? It, was it yeah. in, in, two, in 1999? Uh, so, it? actually, I did this uh, in my... I write a newsletter every week uh, called Windows IT Pro Update. And th this the newsletter was my introduction into the, the job I now have in a way. Uh, I was contacted by what was Duke Publishing at the time. They published Windows NT Magazine, now called Windows IT Pro Magazine. And they asked me if I would write this newsletter. So I started writing it in August 1999. And... So this is a this is an anniversary for you too. Yes, yeah. There's a number of anniversaries here. You know, it's the 15th anniversary of my WinInfo newsletter. Uh, wow, I don't you know have exactly been doing this a long started. time. 15 yeah, years. Yeah, I wrote about that today in in WinInfo a little bit. Um, I don't have any of the early stuff from that, unfortunately. I wish I did. But what I do have is every single editorial I've ever written for Windows IT Pro Update. It was funny. I. Um, looking back, um, one of the, <laughs> the great stories I recalled uh, from the early days was my very first editor. And one of the, one of the stories was um, we had an internet outage and I was going away on a trip. My wife and I were in the car and I actually dictated an editorial to my editor over the phone. <laughs> Your <laughs> so wife would, must have really loved you. <laughs> and, well, she did. I mean, actually, I mean, it let us go, right? I mean. Yeah, that's uh, true. You, yeah, no. But looking back at that first year... Oh, wait a minute. Writing, I have details. Wait a minute. <laughs> details? I've been, handed, I've been handed this important announcement. Okay. We are in S1, <laughs> which is the first floor of the South One Hall. We okay. are on broadcast platform number one. <laughs> okay. At the top of the stairs as you enter. Okay. So come in, hang a Louie. Go up the stairs, look for Broadcast Platform 1. No, we are not in the guide. You cannot search for us because we are not paying exhibitors. We are media. Wow. So that's how you find us. And, Paul, I'm going to have this faxed to your... I want that exact note. <laughs> and please do use fax because that would be an excellent use of technology. I think this is what it's made for. Actually, can you just snap a picture... Of that right now, I, I can. And who wrote that, by the way? That's uh, well, you could you probably recognize the calligraphy. That's uh, that's uh, <laughs> this Comic the, Sans. <laughs> yes, that's Comic Sans. That must be Dane. It's you got it, Dane okay. Golden's amazing handwriting. Actually, I think he took extra care with this, didn't you? He did. He took extra care <laughs> with that. <laughs> he, did. he writes like my wife, um, well, and unfortunately, that's not a compliment. It's a good thing you don't write like your wife, or you wouldn't have been sitting in that car dictating that column. Yes. To continue. Well, no, actually, my wife is an excellent writer. I, I meant from my she, She's a professional writer, isn't she? Yes, she is. Yeah. As opposed to me and well, you. Someone has to be. <laughs> yeah. someone, someone has to. Uh, we just yeah. do it for fun. Handle the business out there. <laughs> I'm sorry. Continue on, <laughs> please, with your anecdote. <laughs> no, no, I was just... I, 15 I years was looking, ago, ladies and gentlemen, this yeah, man was, was 12 years old. Yeah, that's right. No, sadly, I was... But you were a young guy if you've been doing this for 15 years. You were, what, 20? 28. Well, I started writing books in 93. So how many years is that? You've been doing this for a long dang time. Um, yeah. A little, almost as long as I've been doing uh, the, uh, the the radio uh, tech guy thing. Mm -hmm. Dvorak sure. and I started doing that in 91. 
Yeah, I mean, when I started out, I was the uh, then uh, wunderkind. The you know, today's uh, blogger, goobers, or yeah, whatever. You were a wunderkind. So, 93, it was Windows, probably 3.1, maybe Windows 3.1.1. Well, so, yeah, I wrote some books that were uh, Excel and uh, Visual Basic for right, Windows 3X, whatever. Right. Uh, not a fan of Windows 3X no, at all. But it was what we had. That's what we had, yeah. I, was, I used Windows for work groups, uh, 3.1.1, I recall, and... Uh, I don't remember. So but what in ninety nine? What were you writing about in ninety nine? What was the yeah? So it's it's actually funny how the parallels here. In in nineteen ninety nine, there was uh, Windows two thousand was coming out, and Windows two thousand was a product that was delayed and delayed and delayed. And the argument I made at the time, and it's really, it was really interesting to read this uh, so many years later, where I said, you know, this is an, an example of what happens when you take too long to bring a product to market. There is no way that the majority of the goals for this product, which was originally Windows NT 5.0, makes sense over three years later. And I said, if Microsoft learned anything from this experience, I hope it's that small incremental upgrades delivered in a more timely fashion, right, uh, are what happens. And, I, and, I, and the thing that's funny, of course, is that history repeated itself with Windows Vista and that the successor to Vista, Windows 7, works much like the successor to Windows 2000, Windows XP which is that they basically took the foundation from the previous version, fine-tuned it, and, you know, made it better overall. And it, it's interesting because that happened again, you know. Um, one, of the, one of the great stories from that year, um, I was out in Israel for a, a completely unrelated work uh, um, trip. And this guy from the company I was at came in. Uh, he was the CEO of the company, actually. And he said, listen, we we're interviewing a programmer uh, you need to come in and listen to the, what he has to say because he had been interviewing at a company called Mainsoft. Oh. The guy was Russian and he spoke Russian. Oh. So through an interpreter, wow. this guy told me that Mainsoft at the time, this is 1999, was working on a Linux port of Office for Microsoft. That They had been contracted to do this by Microsoft. And it was one of those um, just to see how it would work, if it would work, and not sure if we're going to bring it to market kind of things. And uh, Microsoft, I wrote about it. Microsoft denied they were doing it. Uh, and, of course, it never happened. But it was a, I mean, this guy had no reason to, he never worked on the product. This is something they told him. Hmm. And he just thought it was kind of interesting. So he kind of mentioned it to the guy. I mean, there's no, there's no, he had no idea that I, as a reporter, happened to be there. I mean, wow. it was not done for my benefit. It was completely off the cuff. So very interesting and a very uh, weird coincidence. Um, and then, of course, there was the Microsoft antitrust trial, you know. Um, and that was 98 that that began. Well, it lasted, you know, it lasted, for a long It just life. ended, I think, um, uh, yesterday. Yeah. And, you know, controversial at the time. I mean, I, I called for Microsoft to be broken up, preferably into three different companies, with the hope being that it would increase competition. And it's really interesting to think about, uh, you know, what might have happened if that had happened. Of course, it never did happen. I think Dvorak uh, stole that idea from you. Well, no, I, I, it's not a unique idea. I mean, lots of people should probably have the same idea. But I, I think for, you know, of course, I'm sort of a Microsoft guy or seen as the Microsoft guy. I write for a, a Microsoft-oriented publication. This was, and I've, you know, I have a lot of good friends with Microsoft. I mean, this was, um, this caused some frictions from virtually every quarter you could imagine, uh, my stance on this. I felt huh. very strong about it. And I, and I still do. I still think it would have been better overall. And, and if you look at Microsoft and the stagnation that has occurred in the wake of this antitrust yeah. trial, yeah. you know, you, th you sort of think they won. You know, that they, they somehow, they got away with it, you know, right. that this company somehow, um, you know, got away with it, right? They, uh, they won, you know, they settled, right? But it really, you know, the it past decade. It was a victory. Uh, they, they lost by winning. Yeah. So yeah, we, we right. began the decade with Windows 98. ME came out in September 2000. Uh, XP 2001. So oh, Windows 2000 came up before that. They basically finalized it. You know, I, I want to say in December. But that was when it was still there was still a bifurcated ver Windows. You had your Windows for Business, which was the NT yeah. side, and then you had Windows and for that Consumers. That was my right. So um, the thing was back then when you had the the DOS based versions of Windows and the NT based versions of Windows, which were called NT. You know, NT was better. It was just better. Oh yeah. And and they screwed up NT in many ways. They screwed it up technologically when they integrated Internet Explorer, which was incredibly immature technology, into what was an incredibly solid product. And then they screwed it up kind of from a marketing standpoint when they decided, you know what? 
the Windows brand is more important than NT. We're going to kill NT, and NT will just become Windows. And I, I, NT to me was something special. And I really feel that the combination of these things, uh, they kind of killed it. You know, and I felt I feel bad. I still feel bad about that. I, I, it's just too bad. But you know, so today we have, uh, you know, Microsoft just concluded their EU antitrust stuff, and now I think. Uh, the age of antitrust in the tech industry is going to continue. I think Google is going to face antitrust action very soon from uh, multiple quarters. I, I think Apple probably will as well. And um, it's funny, you know, how things kind of repeat themselves. And, of course, the Windows 2000 thing repeated itself with, um, you know, Windows, Windows Vista. <laughs> ah, yes. What a decade that was. Yeah, I didn't look back over the, the funny thing is just in case uh, anyone is curious, I, in some ways, retrospectives are kind of cheap, right? Oh, well, it's what, uh, I, like I said, it's what we do when there's nothing else to do. Yeah, I mean, they're cheap and I don't like to do a lot of that stuff. Uh, I don't, I don't, I, you know, cheap, I don't, I'll be honest. I, you may feel it's cheap because it's a relatively easy thing to do, but I think yeah. as a reader, I love them. I re it's fun for me to think, for instance, we talked on the radio show, when digital cameras in 1999 Top of the line was the Nikon Coolpix 3 megapixel was the one that twisted. Remember that weird one? Oh, yeah. That was the state of the art. And we've come sure. so far in 10 years with digital no, that's photography. True. Yeah. So okay. I, I don't, it's cheap. You, you, you know, you, you as any good journalist, you want to do reporting. But yeah. it's kind of fun to look back and think about where we were 10 years ago. I think that's fun. I could get lost in this stuff. You know, I, I very too. specifically, yeah. I wasn't sure how I was going to approach this look back thing. And I... I looked at what I did in 1999 and I thought, you know, I could spend forever on this. Let me just focus on 1999. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> One year is it would enough. Be, it would be too hard, well, you know, to, to look at the trends. And and, and as know. everybody knows, the decade won't be over for another year. So we it, Right. So I have time really to work on this. Time. Maybe that's how I'll spend 2010 or 2010 or whatever we're calling it. Uh, Somebody said you can't call it 2010. I thought, what? what? I, I everyone mean, calls it 2010. If you look at the Microsoft product names... Uh, office 2010. That's yeah. what they say. You don't say 2010. That's too much. Yeah. Too many syllables. I do myself tend to say 2010. I, I have a hard time getting over that, but I guess I'm going to have to get used to it. Because you have to look forward to the years and think, well, how are you going to say people don't say 1917. They sound old-fashioned. You know? I don't know. <laughs> 2017. 19 and... You know, get the truth. It's like a say, Gordon Lightfoot song or something. 19 and 17, the Edmund yeah. Fitzgerald sang. So what happened? What would you say the big stories of 2000? Well, actually, before we get to that, I'm curious. You, you did this on Twitch. So what... Was there a single big story of, tw of uh, 2009? Or how did, you, how did you resolve this? What was the... Oh, it was fascinating. Well, actually, we did the decade. So oh, yeah. uh, we had we asked many of uh, our hosts, I believe we asked you, but uh, we, you, you declined to participate. I, I pretty much ignore all your email. I, <laughs> I didn't, I'm sorry. No, no, it's fine. I didn't even get to everybody who did because we just had so many. Yeah. We had many listeners as well. Sure, sure. Uh, a couple of things I'd bring up. The human genome was mapped this decade, and that will end up being perhaps the most important uh, development of right. that decade. We don't know yet, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, the rise of the blog of social media... The blog began, you know, to th the decade began with the blogs, right? And, and almost really, I would say, Gina, Gina Trapani said the rise of the blog. I might almost say the rise and fall of the blog, really. Um, you're a blogger. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I'm not sure, how, you know, I'm not sure what to say about that. I, I, I've basically been blogging for a long, long time before we even called these things blogs. In fact, my news newsletter started out as what we would now call a blog. Right. Yeah, and to right. tell you how old-fashioned this sort of sounds, I mean, imagine this. My boss at the time said, you can't quote from other places and then write about it. You have to write your own stories. And that's why when Info turned into me writing news stories, you know, at the time it was what, what is now an accepted practice, of basically just linking to some other source and then uh, having a conversation around something that someone else wrote. Um, there were, uh, you know, rights issues to that, uh, we we thought, <laughs> foolishly, being old-timers. Right, right. Um, Today, that's accepted practice. I think there's a laziness to blogging that I don't like. And I, there are entire websites based around the notion of, look, someone else wrote something. Here's a link. You know, read about it on our site instead of on theirs. And to me, that's, it's lazy. You know, I write 
very long articles in many cases, you know. So I do blogging, but it's it's obviously secondary to the other stuff I do. And I I I don't know. Blogging is blogging and the replacement of newspapers with blogs and things like that. I think is it's a laziness and a, a and it's something that's going to bite us. I think in the future. I think it's bad overall. Yeah, but yeah. Well, I guess, let me think, what else did we uh, talk about? The, um, I was trying to look and see. Uh, we had, it was great. We had so many great, uh, little Yeah, well, you said these are, these are big topics. We were doing big. We didn't do, no. although yeah. the Microsoft lawsuit was, uh, started in 98 and really went through much of the decade. <laughs> well, so, right, and I think guided where we are today in many ways because, yes. uh, it led to Google and Apple's rise in many ways and Microsoft being, hamstrung and unable to compete in certain markets or unwilling because they're afraid of being bitten again. Uh, it really did rein in what was a monster in many ways and, and changed the, the landscape. Although we have another monster in the making, you know, I, in Google, no doubt about it. And if, and if something doesn't happen there from a regulatory standpoint on multiple content uh, continents, I, I would be really surprised. I mean, this is something I think we need to nip in the bud sooner rather than later. Hmm. This is a company that has uh, unlimited resources for all stand, you know, and it makes no money on anything except for advertising. Uh, they're able to fund incredible products that no sane company with an actual, uh, <laughs> you know, a bottom line would ever be able to do. Um, it's something I think we need to look at. Yep. And I think that, uh, you know, actually you know, getting it back to 2009, I would say that probably is the biggest story of the year in many ways is the rise of this company and how they so effortlessly are able to compete with Microsoft in every single market that Microsoft competes in virtually. I mean, it seems like if Google just decides they're going to do it, they can do anything. They can do anything they want. This is, yeah, I mean, and we, you know, it's hard, uh, but you might even say that Google is the story of the decade. It certainly it was, it's yeah, 11 they years might old. All, yeah, they might prove to be. Yeah. The next decade is going to be amazing, you know, to see what happens with that. I agree. And, and to look back over that 20-year period and see how it happened. You know, so, with Google, looking at Google in 1999, 2000, whatever. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. No one would think anything of this. Well, company. I remember, you know, very well. It's interesting because I can, it's easy for me to do the decade because we started Tech TV in 98. So I can really uh, ch chart at least the first f six years of the decade very much by what we were covering. And it was yeah. the Microsoft thing. It was Google. I remember very well when Google be became the tra the transcendent search engine. It was 99. Yep. Uh, and, and in fact, I remember Dvorak saying, I asked people on Silicon Spin, what search engine they use and i can tell if they're savvy or not depending on whether they say yeah, google or yeah. not and that, right, by, even by 99 you could do that if they said google in 99 or then you knew they're savvy Vista if they said then, alta vista then you knew there were morons you know what um the thing that is interesting about google i think the most interesting in some ways is they became powerful in ways that people didn't understand were happening because of this adword stuff and and the ads and all that um, if Google was just a search engine, they would be popular. But, you know, Twitter's popular. Uh, Facebook is popular. You know, the, this is a company that would be sort of worth money on paper but would have no actual income. Right. They would not be powerful. No. You know, uh, Twitter cannot affect Microsoft. Uh, Facebook cannot really affect Microsoft. Google can kick Microsoft around like they're a little girl. I mean, it, it's really interesting that there's a company like that. For, for them to come up that quickly... And become that powerful and that rich uh, is astonishing. You know, Apple is another success story for the decade. But think about it. This is a company that was huge to begin with, almost went out of business, and has been kind of scrapping back, scrapping back, scrapping back. And they do great in certain markets. And they have lots and lots of money. But they've been, they've been around forever. You know, they, they, they've been around. Google, Google just came out of nowhere. You know, and the amount of money that Google has dwarfs what Apple has and what Microsoft has. It's crazy. Yeah. There's no doubt that that's the big deal. And well, I would throw in, I know you don't want to say this, but I would throw in uh, the fall and rise of Apple as well. Apple at the beginning of the decade. Oh, no, no, absolutely. Right, and actually I didn't, I didn't put that in there. But I, I think of this more from the perspective of um, my own list is based around sort of a Microsoft-centric view uh, by definition, right? Um, I don't know that Apple... I mean, just think about that. I don't think that Apple has impacted any of Microsoft's core markets directly in any meaningful way. But they did, of course, create new markets. Right. You know, the, the MP3 player market was nothing. Apple took it into the stratosphere 
and whatever Microsoft had going on there was the iPod came out in 2001. Yeah. Changed, um, changed the world of music. Absolutely. Uh, Even Apple, though there were MP3 players before that, oh, that did yeah. nothing. Did nothing. Yeah. Same thing with the smartphones, right? There were smartphones before that. Microsoft was one of the players. No big deal. The iPhone is the biggest thing in the world. There's no doubt about it. It's huge. Um, yeah, so those things to me are new. I mean, for all the, you know, <laughs> for all the success uh, of the Mac that gets trumpeted, um, you know, you understand they're still not back to the market share they had in the early 1990s. True. True, but you, market share is not the only way to look. I mean, as ter well, no, terms no, of I profitability, know. they are now capitalized. Uh, yes, no, but that, but but again, in, in terms of impacting Microsoft, right? Uh, uh, they're, they're, they're total core PC business, sales was saying. still talking yeah. under four percent. No, only in mind share, not in market no, share. only in no market share. But I'm saying in mind so, share, they may have impacted. A war, of course. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's one of those discussions that uh, you can go back and forth on. Interminably, yep. and we won't. Um, <laughs> well, what was the big it. Microsoft product of the year? Well, Windows Seven. Oh, yeah, that. Obviously. Yeah, little. Yeah. <laughs> that was kind of a that was a soft. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I it was it. a little product they came out with. It was <laughs> a little nice. thing they came out with. It's cute. <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh, no, <laughs> Quickly, you forget. Deal, you know what's you know, next? <laughs> I don't want to. You know, I don't want to over celebrate Windows Seven in some ways because I feel that this is the type of thing Microsoft should be able to do in their sleep. Um, and I think one of the best effects that, my, uh, that Apple has had on Microsoft is to cause them to make Windows 7, right? So uh, hopefully that will continue and Windows 8 will be just as good. I have a hard time imagining that, but, you know, we'll see what happens there. Um, Windows 7 dwarfs everything else that Microsoft did this year, although... I think it dwarfs almost everything they've done in the last five years. Yes. Um, although they're setting themselves up for some interesting cloud stuff, you know, that doesn't really warrant much mention here because it doesn't sound that it hasn't interesting. It has happened yet. That's why. I mean, no, well, well, some of it has happened. So Windows Azure was finalized. Who cares? You know, we, we don't need to talk about that too much. But Microsoft has their business productivity online suite, which is that, you know, hosted versions of Exchange and all that. Right. That's actually kind of a big deal because that hits their core business market. And getting Microsoft's core group of customers to move to the cloud is going to be huge because otherwise they're going to Google. Right. You know, so they're going to the so you you accept they're going to the cloud. It's just with whom is the is the. Well, they've already question. done it. I mean, yeah. And and by the way, to their credit, and we're we're going back almost a year and a half now. Uh, guys from the Exchange team and talking to me about this product early on before it was uh, even available publicly said to me that they expect very aggressively that hosted versions of Exchange and and now we're talking versions hosted by Microsoft. By the way, not partners, but Microsoft hosted versions of Exchange will outsell from sort of a, uh, a client access license, you know, from a number of seats, number of people actually using the product, um, on-premise versions of Exchange within five years. Um, that's a huge change. You know, Exchange is the de facto corporate standard for email. And what they're saying is it's going to be hosted in the cloud. It's not going to be something that companies install on site. This is a, a massive change in the way that Microsoft does business. So it's a big deal. You know, I have such a blind spot, and, I, and I'm and i the first to admit it with Enterprise that I just don't, you know, I just yeah. don't even see this stuff. And I, now that you say it, of course, but yeah. I'm just, I have a blind spot. Right. No, I, I know. So I'm just, I just throw it out there. It's I, I, it's not even on my list. I didn't mention it. So, um, but it is a big deal. It's a good it point. Really it, no, I think it's a huge deal, especially for anybody who's running their own. Right. And actually, that's one of the big stories is, you know, cloud computing. Stop I, running I get your own from stuff. People who, yeah. I'm sorry? Stop running your own stuff. Don't exactly. run the server. I read a, uh, a great quote today. I think it was in Technology Review Magazine. It's a MIT publication, I think. Um, they have an article about cloud computing security. Ah. And one of, the, one of the standard complaints about cloud computing is like, oh, you know, what are you going to do you know, when some hacker breaks in and blah, blah, you know. You know, um, there is a, an elegant and s s uh, sort of simplicity to the notion that a handful of people, or I guess companies, will be responsible for hosting important services because now when there's a patch for something, it only has to be applied in a couple of places. But when Microsoft puts out a patch for Exchange Server and, you know, something like 57% of the companies that are running Exchange don't install it because, you know what, they maintain their own environment and they know best and, you know, we'll, maybe we'll get to it, maybe we won't. You know what, that's not the best way to do it, sorry. And that kind of puts the cloud computing security uh, equation on its head, if you will, because it, it kind of flips it around, right? It's the opposite discussion that people want to have. Like, uh, things are out in the cloud, so they're vulnerable. Well, you know, things are out in the cloud, they're more easily maintainable, too. 
You know, and I right. think there are both sides to this discussion. It's important. And who would you remember. rather protect yourself, you uh, and your and your crack IT team, or people who do this? Uh, ser for a seriously. And and by the way, um, I can say for myself personally, uh, you know, I maintain the computers in my house. I'm an idiot. Right. Um, I know it's for a fact that the guys the guys who are running email at Penton are idiots. <laughs> and by the way, I should be fired. And I want <laughs> I can't. Oh, stupidest, stupidest. Are you trying to get out email of this policies job? <laughs> I've ever seen in my life? Completely idiotic. Just throwing it out there. Okay. Um, and I'm sure that's true for a lot of people. I'm sure people listening to this who have to put up with the Luddite, you know, you totalitarian views of these people who oversee. They have no idea what they're doing. Yes. They should not be responsible for security. Yes. Uh, let's put it in the hands of people who are actually smart. Pros. Yeah. And let's, you know, it's all about cutting down in many ways the security surface, if you will, right? Um, part of that is reducing the number of points of, of entry. Yeah. Right? What's safer? Five major corporations hosting exchange for everybody or 500,000 little exchange servers all over the world maintained by Bob and Dick and Jane? You know? <laughs> Think about it. Let alone I know it's not Ted that, and it's Carol not, and Alice. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, you know, obviously there are arguments to be made on both sides. I'm just saying for all the cloud computing silliness, uh, the arguments. Do, do, the does corporate out. America uh, accept the idea that they're going to have their data be living uh, in the cloud? Well, or, no, it's not that Are they resistant I mean, to that? Of course, there's going to be resistance to it. There's resistance to technology all across the board. Oh, I was true. talking to a guy. This is just uh, off. This is kind of strange. But a good friend of mine is a movie buff, refuses to go digital because he likes the stuff. You know, he, he bought a Star Trek <laughs> DVD set that looked like the Enterprise. Wow. And I'm looking at, I want to, I'm looking at this guy like, you've got to be kidding. Are you insane? But he has this junk all over his house. You know, um, this is the same mentality, I think, that people have when they look at cloud computing. Some people, same mentality that corporations have when they look at cloud computing. So you're saying that they want the Jabba the Hutt action figurine. Yeah, they do. They want to hold There's it. There's a reason. It's like when a TV guy comes out with four different covers for the same issue. Right. You know, people collect that Collect stuff. all four. Yeah. Those people have problems. <laughs> That's really a bad idea. <laughs> no, but this is the micromanagement <laughs> stuff. We talked about this. I mean, people who are techie tend to micromanage stuff. And yeah, I'm like that's that. That's not always the best no, way to go. I'm like that. I want, to, I want absolute control, even if it's not the best idea. Yep. And, uh, and you're absolutely Yeah, it's right. hard to get over. And, you know, the, any, the everything must go stuff I do. Part of that is... Letting go. I don't need this stuff. I'm not using it. It shouldn't be. It's just also taking up space. Right. Got to move along. Anyway. Any, uh, any flops for uh, Microsoft this year? <laughs> sure. Um, well, I'm Windows surprised Mobile. you... Uh, Windows Mobile, okay. But it, not so much a flop as just not going anywhere. anywhere. Anywhere fast. I would call it a flop. You know, it's losing market share. Nobody likes it. It is the butt of jokes. And they're already talking about, the, you know, they, they talked about the new, the next version before they released the one they just shipped. Right. You know, this is not, this, this is not a sign of health. Yeah. You know, that doesn't mean the next version is not going to be excellent. I, who knows? Uh, but it does mean that the current version is not excellent and does not compete effectively with the market leader. It's not a good, you know, it's just not a good product. Now you, you, I'm, this surprises me. You put the Zune HD in the flop category. Yeah. I thought it was, well... I guess no, in terms no, of sales, listen, no, there's no, no just no in terms not, of anything. How do you nothing. want to measure it? Well, um, it's as an a product, music player, yeah, it's a good product. Right? Yep, great screen. But it ties you into the Zune ecosystem, and what is? Wh why would you want to be tied into that? Right. It's not so much I, that I, it's a flop; it's just that the uh, competition is so successful. But that makes it a flop. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that you lost it's the not boxing that it match. Sucks. It's that the other thing is so <laughs> it's good. It's just well, that, that Mom and that Ali beat the crap out of you. Oh, let's don't get me wrong. The Zune HD is an impressive piece of hardware. But you know something? This is so typical of the day and age that we live in that this thing generated all this buzz before it came out. It generated all this buzz maybe the day it was released, and then it just dropped off the earth. And the reason that it dropped off the earth is it just doesn't do the same stuff that its competitor does. And you know what? It's not enough. Every version of the Zune has offered one or two features that weren't available on the iPod at the time, and those never made a difference, ever. FM radio, you know, uh, the the feature where you could uh, squirt songs to uh, one another, stuff like that. It's always had something. So, you know, it's not like it's a complete piece of junk. But you know what? It has never competed effectively against the iPod. And that is a, that's the definition of a failure. This is the third or fourth generation of this stuff. Nobody uses it. It doesn't matter how good it is. They couldn't, even, uh, they couldn't even keep the squircle alive. 
Right. I tried. <laughs> and that's all I'm saying. It's not my, you know, I have personal reasons for not using the Zune HD around captioning and all that. That has nothing to do with it. If you, uh, one of the things I saw this week, if you look at the Amazon's list of top selling electronics, uh, number two is last year's iPod Touch, which drives me crazy. But number three is this year's iPod Touch. And number whatever, what's, what's, where, how high is the Zune on this list? It's number 82 yeah. or something. I don't remember. Not even close. So, you know what? It's neat, but if you make an awesome product or service or whatever it is, and nobody uses it, yeah, it doesn't really matter. And the App Store stuff, obviously, is what is putting the iPod Touch over the top. You know, when you look at Apple and Microsoft and you compare some of the stuff that they do, Apple's kind of always looking ahead. And it's not that they don't strike out sometimes, but they, they do enough. You know, Apple's uh, iPods that they shipped this past fall were not that impressive at all. I wouldn't uh, put any of them up and say, these are a big deal compared to their predecessors. But no, that's not, in fact, not, I, I wonder how uh, they're, if their days are not numbered, that it's going to be the touch, <coughs> well, the iPhone, think, well, and the tablet that's going to just kind yeah, of... Yeah, so traditional iPods, maybe those days are numbered. But you know what? It doesn't matter because the iPod Touch is an iPod, and that's <laughs> right. Apple... It's not like Apple's genius. losing market. Yeah, they're, they're ready to Apple move people Apple has, the next if thing. anything, increased market share, right, I bet. Right. So they, they are always looking ahead to the next thing. And the next thing is an MP3 player that does apps. The next thing after that, Leo, will be an MP3 player that also has a, f a, um, a camera, mm -hmm. right? Which probably should have come out in September. Well, they did so. it. They did that Nano. Yeah. But, I mean, I'm saying the iPod Touch plus camera yeah, plus the, all the apps. You know, you basically have an iPhone minus the phone. Um, we won't get – we're going to look ahead to 2010, and maybe that discussion is a 2010 discussion. Yeah. But I, but I, I will grant you, although it pains me to do so, that the Zune HD uh, – we can have all the good wishes we want for it. it just, <laughs> but the rea reality is what it is. I want it to succeed. I do too. I love it. It's beautiful. The screen is beautiful. I love it. One of the things that drives me crazy about the iPhone slash iPod Touch, by the way, is you can't customize the background of it, and you can't position icons as you would. No. So if you if you if you consider an iP an iPhone and you put it next to an Android, one of the cool things about the Android is you can put a couple of icons on the bottom or wherever you want them. And then you can see through to this beautiful picture that you may want, maybe a picture of your kids or some <clears throat> vacation spot or whatever. You know, the iPod uh, Touch and the iPhone are very rigid, you know, and they're not as customizable and they're not as, as you know, pretty as a result, whatever. You know, the Zune has some uh, notion of that as well. Although actually, to be fair, in the Zune HD, they kind of killed that as well. It was nicer in the older version, um, you know, for customizing it. So it's not that the Zune HD doesn't do stuff that the iPod Touch doesn't. It does. It's just not enough. It just hasn't made a difference. Yeah. Uh, this was the uh, year that the EU finally stopped picking on Microsoft. You know, we could have called this one, I think, if we had looked ahead and we said, when is Neely Crows going to leave? <laughs> because it's going to end for that. And that's exactly what happened. Neely Crows was... The competition commissioner for the EU, uh, for the well, for the European Commission, the regulatory arm of the European Union, and the person most directly opposed to Microsoft. I mean, she was she's there, Thomas Penfield Jackson. She hates those people. She, hates them. So, so really, it was you think it was her uh, spe spearheading the thing all along. If you can, I, it, <laughs> it's almost a, a Monty Python skit to imagine uh, <laughs> that a company like Opera could approach the EU and convince them. To yeah. launch an investigation, yeah. Yeah. you're right. To have them actually sue Microsoft, yeah. To then find them billion or millions of dollars, to then actually force Microsoft to change their product to meet the needs of this company that has pro all, all that has proven is that it cannot compete. It alone, of all the companies in this market, cannot compete against Microsoft. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. So here we are. It's coming to a close. So she's, she she is she has she stepped down? She's uh, as today's her last day, is my understanding. Uh, December two thousand. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Witch old witch, yeah. the wicked witch. Ding dong, the wicked witch is dead. I don't there's, know her personally, but I there's dancing in Redmond. I don't like her. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, we talked about cloud computing. Uh, yep. I guess. There's not much more to say about PC gaming, although would you right. count 2009 as the year it died or got mortally wounded? <laughs> no, I think it's been on a downward spiral for a long time. 
and it's and for all the reasons we already discussed, there's a lot of reasons. Um, it's not actually going away. I mean, people who care to uh, game on PCs will be able to do so. But you know, 2009 was a year that we saw some interesting trends. You know, for example, the Call of Duty game that came out, and they didn't put dedicated servers on the PC. Now, in the past, the PC market would have been so huge, and the complaints would have been so vast that they could have forced this company to do what they wanted. But now they, they're not really the big deal anymore. So now Infinity Ward can do what they want because they're keeping the console gamers happy. Right. And that's what matters right. you know, to them. So now, you know, for, and this is not true for all game types. I get that. I don't want to revive this conversation. But, um, you know, for many games, the console is where all of the development occurs and the port occurs from the console to the PC. It's, a second, it's the second thing. Right. You know, it's not first anymore. So there you have it. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of stuff there, but I think we've beaten it to death. And uh, game of the year, I don't think we have to ask. Uh, it's obvious. <laughs> Me personally, yeah, it's obvious. Yeah, well, but it, it also historical, right? Because this is the biggest entertainment launch in in history. Not merely biggest it's, game, but bigger than a movie, bigger yeah, than music, bigger than any biggest movie, in, any yeah, book, yeah. anything. Yeah. yeah. Yep. yep, that 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 probably was a, in a watershed in a way too. When uh, yeah, we knew that was coming. It's been coming for a long time. But yeah, we actually this one was forecasted to to be the case. Although it, Avatar, easily. I wonder if Avatar's knocked that off. The Avatar yeah. had a very big week, half almost See, half a billion. But you're right; it wasn't half. It wasn't. I think it was half a billion for uh, oh five Warfare. days. Yeah. I mean, it was, it's yeah. crazy how much money they made yeah. on this thing. Of course, yeah. it's a sixty dollar title compared to a fifty dollar movie. I don't know what did it cost thirteen dollars. <laughs> yeah, but uh, look, by the way, so that sounds, you made it sound expensive, but I uh, looked at another way. Per hour? Avatar lasts for two hours. Right. right? 6.50 an hour. I've been playing uh, Call of Duty nonstop since it came out. So, I, I mean, I'm, it's, it's, I figure the more I, time I spend on it, the more value I've gotten out of it. So it's uh, eventually it will pay for itself. I, Avatar has made, uh, as of our recording, six hundred and eighteen million dollars worldwide. So, you know what's it's with. I'll I'll take away one other piece of uh, you know deduction from this, which is you know you look at Modern Warfare two and Avatar. There's no question we are spending more for content than ever before, and that the movie industry and the recording industry that's been bitching and moaning about us being pirates, right. It must be the greediest SOBs in the world because they're doing yeah, fine. Um, thank you. Wasn't it last year that the the best selling movie of the year was Iron Man? I think well, a year before, right? And it was also the most pirated movie. In fact, I think the pirated version of the movie came out before the movie came out. Right, that could be wrong. Didn't, no, it did. Wrong. That was one I of the things people said. Oh no, it won't do well now. Uh, oh yeah, I think I said it okay. Seven. I'm sorry, seven hundred forty five million according to Box Office Mojo. So it's probably pretty close to Modern Warfare too. It's not a. It's an entertainment launch. Record. In other words, if right. you look at the, the first, first 24 hours, yeah, the first yeah, yeah. five days, whatever yeah. it is. Um, but both of them are doing very well. <laughs> There's no question. Those are two, yeah. two successful yeah. things. And I might point out, both doing well primarily with geeks. Sure. You know, we do rule the earth. We rule now. You no, know, we, we should stand up for ourselves. Yeah. Stop. You no know? no more jokes about bad glasses and... <laughs> not getting dates. Although, by the way, there's nothing worse than having glasses on and having to put 3D glasses on. That's what I did. I watched right? Avatar with two pairs of glasses. Talk about it. cool. Yeah. And, the, and the glasses, we were at a Real, the, Real D house, which the, they actually look like nerd glasses. They're thick black frames. Oh, they're like the, uh, the old lady glasses from Florida. <laughs> yeah. The big, thick yeah. black frames on top of my regular glasses. And it, was, and it wasn't like they, my regular glasses kind of fit inside. Yeah. No, oh, awesome. I was that kind of dork who was wearing two glasses. Good stuff. Uh, I looked like Sorry. Urkel. <laughs> that's why I hiked my pants up to my waist. Up, up, up my waist. <laughs> yeah, that's why. So you know why that was. It was there was no other reason. <laughs> Let's take a break. We're going to come back and talk about what to look forward to in 2010 with Paul Thorat, Windows expert at the Super Site for Windows, winsupersite.com. But before I go on, i got to talk about Vegas because we're going, baby. Vegas, the Las Vegas Express. The entire Twit team's going down there. Some of us are flying, but some of us are driving in our brand new Lincoln. We got a Lincoln MKT just for the week. Uh, Lincoln's lending us this car so we can, it's got the sink in it, so we can show off the sink. So if you see me in Vegas, say, hey, I want to take a test drive. And I will go out, we'll go out in the lot, and I'll show you the sink. 
the amazing hands-free calling music and podcast search turn by turn navigation i'll have all three phones i'll have them all paired i'll show you how i could play a song from any phone how i could connect my ipod or my zune hd via usb because yes ford sync comes with usb it also comes with gps and turn by turn directions that you call for the whole idea is you keep your hands on the wheel your eyes on the road but you press that button and you say Give me directions to Vegas, baby, and it will walk you through it. It'll even tell you if the traffic's bad, thanks to the great serious uh, travel link information. It, travel link also gives you things like the best fuel prices along the way. If you're running low on gas, you press the button, you say travel link, you say fuel prices. It'll show you the nearest gas station or the cheapest gas station and then route you there. Movie times, you want to know, you say, hey, I'd like to see Avatar along the way. It'll tell you that. It'll even read you uh, headlines from the New York Times and other news sources. It'll play you podcast by name. You could say, I want to hear Windows Weekly. It's just incredible. We'll be there, and I hope you'll join us. We're bringing the whole gang. Paul's going to be there. Dick D. Bartolo, uh, Ryan Shrout from PC Perspective, Ryan Block from GDGT will be joining us. Dr. Kiki and I will be going to the parties together, and it's just going to be a blast. July, uh, January 6th through 10th, you can watch live at live.twit.tv. We'll be doing it. Wednesday and Thursday evening, and then all day Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And, of course, we have a new Twit Live at CES podcast. You can download the audio and the video directly uh, from the Zoom store or your iTunes store. It's going to be a lot of fun. And we do really thank Sync for uh, helping us get our gear to uh, Vegas and back safely and uh, sponsoring our entire trip, making it possible. If you want to know more about Sync, just go to SyncMyRide.com. That's the Ford Sync site, the site for Sync owners. Sync, S-Y-N-C... MyRide.com, and uh, they've got videos there and stuff explain how you know how it works and all that stuff. SyncMyRide.com. All right, Paul, let's take a look now. Let's go back to or ahead rather to 2010 mm -hmm. and yep. what we're looking forward to in the year to come. I can tell you, there's two big announcements coming up next month that everybody's excited about. Looks like the Nexus One phone from Google is going to be uh, out January 5th. And it yep. seems pretty clear from rumors that the, the iPad or the Slate, whatever the tablet from Apple is going to come out. <laughs> yeah, whatever it's called. January 26th. And whatever it is, right? I think that's an interesting bit of the It could mystery. be a book reader. It could be an entertainment yeah. device. We don't know. I, You know, as I've said before, selfishly, I would like it just to be an iPod Touch with a bigger screen because that's what I want. Um, but who knows? I think it will be at least that. I think it's the potential to be, and, and the rumors are something much more significant. I guess so, but what could it be? You know, you think about the the sort of tablet devices that are already out. You know, is it a, yet another mobile internet device? In which case, it's kind of like what, what, what? Right. You know, I, I don't know. I, to me, it 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 almost needs to be tied to other stuff. You know, maybe that subscription service that's been rumored for TV shows, or you know, there needs to be more because otherwise, it's just more of the same. And again, you know, a, a, an iPod Touch with a bigger screen would be quite welcome here, but. I don't look at that as a big business model, right? You know, well, it seems so, to be that they're going to go after the uh, ebook readers. Yeah, but even that has a that's limited not, appeal. It's an unproven you know, and, market. And, yeah, it's an interesting. And by the way, um, I, I I would just burst that bubble by saying it is inconceivable that Apple could have orchestrated deals with all the major publishers and none of it has leaked out. And you've actually heard no rumors to that effect. So, I, I the ebook reader thing to me doesn't make a lot of sense. I do but, not think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> Which word? Inconceivable. Inconceivable. Uh, <laughs> no, no. It's Does conceivable. It no, you're, yes. You make a very, very good point, which is uh, if it's going to be a book reader, they have to have content deals. And clearly yeah. they haven't. I mean, maybe they have some. There's certainly been rumors that they've been talking to uh, well, so uh, people like the New York Times. So what's the better market here? So what, let's think about this for a second. You know, Apple has an app store, which is already there. Uh, and one of the apps that could be on there is a Kindle app, which is, right. and it's free. And, uh, you know, Kindle or uh, I'm sorry, Amazon is making money when you buy books. You know, does Apple need that to succeed? Or, I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I, I could picture electronic books being sold alongside audio books and other content in the iTunes store, I guess. It could be but, just a failure of our imagination. Let's see. Maybe the marvelous mind of Steve. Sure. Has come up. Well, with that's something. why that's why this is so interesting because I cannot myself with my little brain 
come up with anything that makes any sense Me for this too. device. I, I, Me too. I've I been saying on MacBreak Weekly in front of Mac bigots, I've been saying for yeah. a year, I don't get it. Uh, yeah. We've had tablets. I don't way, get it. The sheer pass that this thing gets with the press astonishes me. Everyone is talking about this like it's the second coming. Nobody knows what it is. I think <laughs> you know? I, I think there's and, a pass because I think Steve has in the past proven that with the iPod in 2001 and the iPhone in 2007 that he can, in fact, but, uh, recreate okay, but, a category. All right. So you invent the iPod. And then the next thing you come up with is the iPod mini, you know. It's not really a new thing. It's just uh, it's you know kind one. of an obvious continuation yeah. of what you already have. Yeah. Unless this is something incredibly special, this slate thing is just the next version of the iPhone or another. It's like the Kindle DX or something. I mean, it's not a new thing. It's just a another thing of another the same thing. So it, this is what I'm saying. It has to for this to be truly exciting. There has to be something going on here that we don't understand. And it's hard to imagine what that could be because you you sort of think through the possibilities. You know, it's not a lot there to see. I don't know. I don't. I don't. It's intriguing because it's Apple and they've been right so many times. So you want to you want to know more. But I, I can't. I, I mean, we can, it's hard to get excited about something that we don't even We're, know what it right. is. So that's that's kind of what what I've been saying is I don't just as you have. I don't get it. Yeah. I'll be very curious to see what happens. Sure. Well, I, I want to see it. January twenty sixth. Let's find out. Yep, and I'll buy one. I don't care what it is. Oh, I will too. It. Sad and insane. Yeah, I've yeah. already ordered it. So actually, the, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. couldn't care less what so, it is. Uh, oh, but but we need to separate. Well, you and I are different. Uh, yeah. Our stupidity, our right. internal stupidities, right. with maybe the advice we would give other people. Right. Right. I mean, I subscribe to Mobile Me. Um, do I recommend this to people? No. In fact, I openly mock it. But. I need to keep an eye, I, an eye on what Apple's doing in the cloud. And I think that's going to improve and change next year as well, by the way. Uh, not that that matters to anybody listening to this. But it's just because I do it doesn't mean, you know. Right. I mean, uh, I don't recommend that. I don't write that on, you know, I have a page on my site what I use. I don't mention that because I don't want people to think that I'm recommending that's something, it. I don't yeah, recommend yeah, yeah. it. All right. Uh, Windows Mobile 7, finally. Yeah. This year. Right, so in March, uh, there might be a little bit of this at CES. I guess not. I, I was just talking to someone from Microsoft about what I, what we can expect at CES, and, and maybe there won't be a lot of Windows Mobile 7 stuff there. But in March, at least, at the Mix conference, also in Vegas, Microsoft, I think, is finally going to unveil a lot of information about Windows Mobile 7. And I think this is make or break time for this product because, you know, let's face it, they're already two years behind the iPhone. So despite having been in the market for, you know, 10 years, um, this is something they need to fix and it needs to happen now. It needs to happen. It needed to happen three months ago. So um, this is the year for Windows Mobile 7. We'll see what happens. And, and we know for sure it'll come out? Yeah. Well, that's what they've said. Yeah, by the end of the year. By the end of the year. All right. Yeah, yeah it is kind of the last gasp. And in a way, they may benefit by having uh, not, you know, not having put it out yet. Maybe... They can watch and learn and listen and uh, and and do I think something they've watched and learned and listened too much <laughs> as it is. You know, frankly, I see thing. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, they're late. How about uh, Windows uh, Live? Any uh, yeah? So it's been there? kind of a quiet year for Windows Live, right? A year ago, they came up with Wave, what they call Wave Three. You know, the third major version of the Essentials applications and also the online services. And then we really haven't heard much. You know, there's been. You know, Bing is sort of on the side of it. You've got uh, Windows Live Movie Maker, which was finally finalized later in the year and all that. But these apps are, are all scheduled for my, a major makeover, including, you know, the ribbon user interface that we've seen uh, in some Windows 7 apps and in Office 2010 and all that. So, excuse me, Office 2010 for our earlier discussion. Um, but, uh, you know, again, not a lot of information. So... Uh, I don't know when it's happening, and I, I, I guess I expect it later rather than sooner. There's not been a lot of buzz about it, uh, some minor things here and there. But, um, again, you know, <laughs> this is an area where Microsoft needs to move a lot more quickly. Supposedly, uh, that was the point of this Windows Live stuff. It allows them to innovate more quickly, but, you know, it's been pretty quiet. And I'd like to see some information about it. I'd like to know what's going on there because, they, you know, again, the cloud is an important aspect of their strategy and i think they need to get going on that but we'll we'll definitely hear something and, and probably see uh, a way for a release sometime in 2000 excuse me in 2010 i'm never going to get used to that <laughs> 2010 
2010. 2010. I've been using Office uh, 2010. Um, yes. Is it normal that every time, because I did the... Um, <laughs> You're laughing. I already know whatever you're going to say, is the answer is going to be, no, that's not normal. Go ahead. I can't wait to hear this one. So I'm doing that. What do they call it? The the download and run? Yeah, click to run. Click yeah. to run. Yep. And every time I launch Outlook, every time it says downloading Outlook. Oh, really? That can't be you right. You know, I've gotten an email or two like that, and I've not seen that. Um, okay, so something's the wrong. The solution, by the way, is not to run Outlook. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> Whoa, I didn't even think of that. You heard it no, here first. Here's what happened. Here's what happened. Uh, I had yeah. uh, Office 2007, uh, uh, whatever the last one was, on there. And um, it couldn't... 20, I, 2007. 2007. <laughs> Ots, <laughs> Office Art 7 on that. And yeah. I couldn't uninstall it. I tried to uninstall it, and I couldn't. So really? probably there's traces of it left. And then I... That well, because I thought I'd use the beta. Yeah, that yeah. could be it. Although, uh, I don't know. The click-to-run version is supposed to exist side-by-side. I know, except for Outlook. Outlook is the one where people, everybody that's says, some yeah, weird is without, yeah, you don't yeah. want to have both versions it of could Outlook. Be, yeah. So maybe that's what it is. But I do okay. love, I love the click to run. But it, but it, so yeah. it should download components as needed, but once it's downloaded them, it doesn't ask again. It's not supposed to, but uh, again, I, I have not seen that myself. I do run this as well, but okay. I have heard that from some people. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I guess the alternative would be to uninstall that. And download the other version, right? Right, the non click to run version, do and that, install yeah. it locally. It's you know a couple hundred megabytes, right? Nah, no big deal. Yeah, no big deal. So uh, Office 2010 is going to be the big story of 2010, I guess. Or a big story, yeah, one of the big ones. I think yeah. it'll be a big release. And again, you know, I, I think from the as, from the point of view of the core applications, it's kind of a minor upgrade in many ways, uh, especially if you're a Word guy like I am. You know, it's it's not anything major, but. I think the work they've done across the suite um, to improve all the products and, and make them look the same and improve the ribbon and all that and uh, some of the strategies they have around the product versions, you know, they're going to have a free version of Office for the first time and, of course, the web-based versions of Office. Uh, I think it's going to be a big deal, you know. So, it, And Office is one of those things. Um, I made a post about this the other day. You know, people are trying to invent competition for Office as if openoffice.org is somehow taking over the earth. But the truth is there's Microsoft Office and that's it. There is nothing else. I mean, Google Docs is a joke. OpenOffice.org looks and works a lot like older versions of Office, but it's not, it's just not Office. It's not the same thing. You know, Office is still a, a big deal. So, you know, it's obviously it's something I use every single day, but it is one of those things. I mean, I, I have no I've never ever questioned using this or wanted to use something else. It's a great, it's a great product. And the 2000, 2010 version is is fantastic. Yeah, hey, I'm excited. How about um, <laughs> this was something Microsoft showed. Uh, yeah, you know what I'm talking about at uh, E3. You got a lot yeah. of attention, sure. uh, some mocking, but but mostly interest, and yeah. then nothing. And and every once in a while, people bring up Project Natal. Right. You know what I love about Project Natal? What is every once in a while. Microsoft will bring someone in and let them play a game with it. And then they'll come out and be like, oh, my God, it really works. And, you know, they, they freak out. And what those people don't understand is that they have not used Project Intel like as an Xbox controller. They've used it in a controlled environment to play a single game or maybe yes. a handful of things. Well, that was the complaint. It's not that, the same thing. Yeah. It's just not the same thing. Right. And, and it reminds me of that. We've told the story before, but the, the very first time I talked to the Xbox guys about the 360... And they showed me the two Power Macs, this humongous desktop computers, right? Side by side, linked with cables. That was the development system for the Xbox 360. And wired to it was a wired version of the Xbox 360 controller. And they had just announced the, what the form factor was going to look at. Remember the goofy web event with the, the Frodo guy from Elijah Wood hosted it or whatever. They had just done that. <laughs> the Frodo guy. <laughs> and... <laughs> So, so they had the shell. They had the plastic shell. Right. And so the very first thing I looked at, I, I said to them was, okay, so your development system is in a, a, a two computers the size of a Volkswagen bug, and you're going to somehow fit it into this little plastic box. I don't get it. How's that going to work? And they said, oh, no, we got guys. They, they know this stuff. They, it, it, no problem. And, of course, what followed was uh, several years of the most unreliable consumer electronics product ever made, uh, the worst product recall, the most expensive product recall in consumer electronics history. And now you believe, whoever you are, <laughs> that this Project Natal thing, you, you believe this thing. Do you really? Really? 
Well, that's going to be funny. So <laughs> uh, the product that has no name and has no release date, uh, maybe it comes out in 2000, uh, 2010. Uh, maybe it does. I don't know. I would expect uh, to see some demo of it at CES. And if I understand the naive nature of the bloggers and other people who cover this industry, we'll all golf clap it and proclaim it the next big thing. But, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I don't, I, don't I, don't trust, I don't trust them. I don't know. Let's see. Certainly it's not going to take over anything. It's not, uh, we're not going to be playing a, a future version of Call of Duty where we're running in place on a, you know, on a mat and, you know, mock throwing grenades <laughs> in the air. And, and, I don't want to do that. No. It's too much work. I want to use the controller. Yeah. You know, right. it's interesting because uh, there are some who say that that is the interface on the new Apple tablet. It's got a camera on the front, and you will be gesturing to it. Gesturing. I, I got some gestures for those people. <laughs> 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 oh, no. Like, I mean, you know, we're, we'll head in those ways. I mean, we'll I don't head know. in those The minority report thing, you know, where you slide. Yeah, yeah. Around. They did I that told you in, my uh, minority Avatar report. Too. My minority report uh, pet peeve, right? If, if you watch this movie, they do that thing and like you're doing. You're they, right. They move stuff Slung around in real around. time. Yeah. And then Tom Cruise needs a, a file that some other guy has. <laughs> yeah. And they have to put it into a pla It's a basically a USB card, <laughs> and then carries it over to Tom Cruise's computer. Oh. Plugs it into his computer, and then he can access the file. I'm so. Disappointed. And I'm thinking to myself, come on, you you envision this incredible future world. <laughs> you don't have a wireless you network. Still, you still have sneaker net. You don't have peer-to-peer -peer networking? It doesn't occur well, here? I've in had this the Tom Cruise thing, thing uh, for quite a while. Watch. Here we go. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> you know what made that work was the yellow sponge. <laughs> <It did. laughs> That's nice. Look at that. I can scrub. There we go. That's nice. Yeah, see? It's, sure. not, it's, it's not magic. No, it's not magic. It's just, you know. It's like magic. It's like, it's, it's hey, they, Tim <laughs> Allen had it on Home Improvement. Sure. Uh, you know, all this is is a it's like an homage to the video toaster. <laughs> it's more know? than an homage, it's actually it is the, video the video toaster. toaster. Yeah. Let's just clean up that window there. Oh. Like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, okay, all clean. Oh, uh, Windows SP, Windows Seven SP One. Will that be out? Yeah, not, yeah. So not a lot of people know about this or talking about it, whatever. But. Oh. Uh, yeah, you can expect the service pack one exactly a year after the initial version shipped. And the only question is whether there'll be new features. Um, I think, uh, and I would also re remind people that the service pack applies to the server as well. So there'll be different things going on on the server side and on the on the client side. But yeah, you can expect service pack one in late 2010. Definitely. It will be a roll up though, not anything big and. Different. Well, we don't know. We don't know that. I don't know. We don't yeah, know new features. Who knows? So I think the story of 2009, is obviously, in PC hardware, was netbooks. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. In 2010, is the network netbook going to continue? Uh, is it is is it? Uh, are people going to yeah. finally get fed up with these cheap, crappy PCs? What's what's the story with netbooks? You think? I, I can you know speaking from personal experience only, I can say I have a netbook and I really I really enjoy it. I love it. You love and your netbook more often than not. If we're going to be watching TV and you know. Hanging out on the couch or whatever. That's what and you I, have in your lap. I'll bring that one over. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. It's a neat little computer. I happen to use it for media management, essentially, and it works well for that kind of thing. Uh, it's not as fast as my regular notebook. It's certainly nowhere as fast as my uh, desktop computer and all that stuff. But it is that kind of utility computing, and it's it's good enough. And I think it is good enough for people. I, I, I would caution people not to replace computers with netbooks. Use them as sort of right. a a side machine, but, um, yeah, I mean, I see netbooks yeah, continuing to be a big deal and I think it will last beyond the effects of this economic recession. I think this is a market segment that will just be there, whether it merges into some other kind of low end, you know, notebook or whatever, um, you know, who can say, but I think these small form factor, uh, computers will continue nicely, you know, just as uh, smartphones will, right. And, and the silly debates over what, constitutes a smartphone is very similar to the debates over well, what is a netbook and it doesn't really matter because this is something that will evolve over time just like our understanding of what a computer is has evolved over time mm -hmm. so i expect some evolution there on the netbook side but uh yeah i think they're going to continue along yeah absolutely and some of them will be tied to 3g network subscriptions just like smartphones i think that's a good market um, for those companies you know for the wireless networking companies i think that's a good market to focus on and uh, potentially a good deal for some people as well.
So yeah. And so netbooks and then smart books are kind of like well, smart books. Oh, a smart book. And again, I I kind of hate the the nomenclature here, but a smart book. My understanding of what a smart book is, it's a, a netbook to class computer tied to a three G connection that's running a non mainstream non-PC operating okay. system. So the netbook is Windows. You smart be book is Android. Android. You know, a netbook yeah, okay. running Android would be a smart book. And a notebook, obviously, is a laptop. Right. And all three will continue. Yeah, I think so. Unless... Unless something else happens. Something magical happens with a tablet, <laughs> and then everybody <laughs> then says, I, say, I want well, that. A, a, an Apple tablet or whatever tablet. Uh, right. You know, an ultra-mobile PC, as we might have called them uh, four years ago on the Microsoft side. <laughs> um, yeah, they may continue, too. That I mean, was a flop. This. Yeah, it uh, was, but you know was. what? It's a decent little machine. And by the way, if you look at an ultra mobile PC uh, from four years ago, or whatever, but an inch thick, it's you have to think. I think it'd be half as thick today. Yeah. Uh, a nicer screen, nice. I mean, they, there's no reason that kind of. Th I would love a machine like that. We'll you know, just have to wait and see. I just don't want to pay a thousand bucks for it. Right. Oh, and you know, if, if it's Apple, it's going to be eight hundred. Well, that's seven. That's the thing. I mean, let, let, you're right. I mean, we we're really pretending that the company that can't sell a decent iPod touch for under 300 bucks is going to magically come out with a bigger version of it that's going to cost less. I mean, think about it. Hey, you did something I think kind of fun and we'll yeah. we'll roll this into our uh, Audible ad cuz it is okay. your favorite Audible books of 2009. Okay. Audible is the uh, audio bookstore that we talk about all the time on the show. It's uh, just a great place to get your books uh, if you like to listen. And I know you like to listen to podcasts, so you're you're already halfway there. Audible has 65,000 titles, some of the best books ever written, available for download instantly. You can listen on almost any uh, portable device. Do check their devices list to make sure it's compatible. It does work with the Zune, the iPod, the Kindle, many GPS devices. Um, and, you know, download takes a minute. Then you got the book on there, and wherever you go, in the car, at the gym, doing housework, you've got a great book to listen to. Yep. What were your favorites of uh, 2009? So... Uh, it's the Nightmares and Dreamscape series by Stephen that. King. Yeah, each story is read by a different person, and I think you, you, some people who've been listening for a while may recall that when we originally had this book on, I had been listening to one of the. It, it's a collection of short stories. You know, uh, the the book itself just became an audiobook this year. Like I said, every story is re read by a different person, celebrities, and so forth. And there's a story in there. I'm listening to it, and I, I'm thinking, I recognize this voice. It's driving me crazy. Who is this person? <laughs> listening and listening, and then finally it occurred to me. It's the woman who plays Lisa Simpson on The Simpsons. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so That's cool. Uh, there's some neat, uh, neat choices in there um, for, the, for the readers, but it's a fantastic collection. Unfortunately, it's three separate audiobooks, right, because it's volumes one two, and three. Um, but it, it's yeah, easily, I would say, the best uh, audiobook of the year. And what's your pick this week? This is kind of an interesting one. Audible is having what they're calling a holiday relief sale. I like it. Yeah. So 100 it's a, it's plus a, unabridged books for 10 bucks each. Yeah, which is a great deal. But one of them is Jaws by Peter Benchley. This is a book I have, in fact, read a long, long time ago. And I checked it out. You know, I, I told you earlier, I was looking at that uh, kind of a self-help book earlier. I was... The, the reading of it was terrible, you know, and, and that's very rare, by the way, on Audible. But this one, it was just something stilted about it. If you play a clip of this one, uh, for Jaws, uh, by well Peter Benchley, yeah, yeah, it's really neat. It's, right. it's got that classic Audible feel to it. It's uh, Eric Steele is uh, doing the narration. Here's a little bit from Jaws. The great fish moved silently through the night water, <laughs> propelled by short sweeps of its crescent tail. The mouth was open just enough to permit a rush of water over the gills. There was little other motion. An occasional correction of the apparently aimless course by the slight raising or lowering of a pectoral fin as a bird changes direction by dipping one wing and lifting the other. You're right. This is That's classic. Yeah, classic. And so. you can see it. And that's the, kind of the point with audiobooks is your brain is yeah. good at this. It, it's very, these books are vivid. Yeah, so this is a good one, and uh, if you're not a if you're not a subscriber, this would be a great way to start. If you are a subscriber, I'd just point out it's nine ninety nine. That's a great price for that. So yeah, well, and uh, you can get it free too. We're gonna we're, you know yeah. if you go to audible.com slash windows, uh, you'll sign up for the gold account. That gives you a book a month. Mm -hmm. You know uh, the subscription is a, is the best way to do it. They do have these sales all the time, so you can always just buy a book here, a book there. But uh, I subscribe I have a two book a month subscription, but you can get the one book a month. And by going to audible.com slash windows, the first book is free and yours to keep 
you can cancel at any time. So, yeah, I mean, don't be deceived by the, If this is the book you want, get it. It's 9 hours, 37 minutes. I think this would be a great first audio book, great way to introduce you to the genre. And if this is the kind of book you love, and I know it is for Paul and me, we, we love these kinds of uh, suspense and thrillers. This would be a great choice. I've never read the book. I've only seen the movie, so I'm definitely getting this one. Audible.com slash Windows. We thank him for their support of Windows Weekly. And now, Paul, how about, mm -hmm. since we're talking about the best, how yep. about your tip of, uh, your favorite tip of 2009? Right. So I picked two um, because I couldn't really decide. You know, one is very recent. It might be, I think it was from last this past week, but it's that invisible <laughs> hand add-on for oh, IE. Yeah, Roman you know what? Everybody, I got so much positive feedback on that. Yeah, People it's love such, that. It's awesome. And if you happen, I don't, I haven't installed it in IE or Firefox, but in Chrome, which is what I've been using lately, it just, it, it, there's no UI at all until it, you need it, yep. right? It's that so way in Firefox too. Sudden, yeah, I awesome. forgot it's, I installed it and I yep. was on an Amazon page and it all just said, oh, this is the best price, by the way. And I thought, uh, no, oh, that's so cool. So in my case, I thought I didn't install it because it doesn't do anything. Right. And I thought, oh, I better, maybe I should try it again, you know, and then you run through it and you realize, oh, wait, that's all, that's all it, does. it does. And then you browse around and it, it just works great. It's it's such an awesome add-on. So the idea um, is when you're on a shopping site and it works with Amazon and others, uh, it tells you where other what other prices are. And if there's a better price, it says, hey, don't buy it here. Yeah. Try it's it. excellent. Yeah. It's just excellent. You know, I set my wife up. My wife's uh, computer arrived this week. And I set her up with that. And, uh, yeah, she already was one of the first things she said. This thing is awesome. What is, you know, yeah, it's, and it, it's, cool. just, it's really neat. Yeah. Well, I'll give so you the it. second one is uh, we talked earlier about um, the issue on PC gaming and how this has generated a lot of email. And that's true. The past couple of weeks, this has been the big topic uh, on my email. But looking back over the year, I've never gotten any more email, I don't think, about anything other, more than the issue of clean installing Windows 7 using the upgrade meet and how Microsoft completely bungled the yeah. um, communication of how that works and all that kind of stuff. So um, I have a guide to successfully clean installing Windows 7, regardless of the media that you have, regardless of the situation. Uh, it's on my Windows 7 page. So if you just go to, you know, winsupersite.com slash Windows 7, you'll see it. It's called clean install Windows 7 with upgrade media. It will work every time. I've gotten so much email from this, um, including... Every day, I mean, almost every day, I get email about it still. And it's the type of email where someone will say, you know, I have a valid copy of Windows Vista. I don't want to throw it on the PC. I just want to install Windows 7. I actually called them and thought I could activate it. They wouldn't let me, they actually wouldn't let me do it, which kind of surprised me. So I said, screw it. I'll just use the guy that Paul has. It worked immediately. Thank you so much for saving me the hassle because what they wanted me to do was reinstall everything. And, you know, there's no reason for things to be that dumb. And I, I just, it, it, it's exasperating. It's one of those things you have to deal with with a company like Microsoft. So uh, it's nice to be able to have a, a guy that just kind of works every time. So that's there if you need it. Yeah, I refer people to that almost every week on the radio show, Paul. People are always still asking this question. And I yeah. say, you know, you, th this is the yep. definitive guide. There, it's everything you want to know is there. Right. It's this well done. Thank you. This is the kind of service you provide that really makes a big difference, I think. Thank you. So those are two old tips. Do you want to do yes. a new tip? I do have a new tip. This one comes from Keith Ropp. And this is, by the way, uh, I, I almost, this is like hit my head on the desk it, that this has never occurred to me. Um, one of the things that has come up again and again this year with Windows 7 coming out, we talked about it on the podcast, is there's a new taskbar. And because it's brand new to Windows 7, you know, you have to think that some of this stuff isn't fully fleshed out. You know, you can look at Mac OS 10 and the, the way they did the dock, and you know from your experience with it, that this thing evolved over time. Yeah. That's how this stuff works. And so, you know, looking at the Windows 7 taskbar, that there are certain things that don't work the way you want them to. And, you know, maybe they'll get it right in Windows 8. Maybe they'll get it right in SP1 if we're lucky. You know, who knows? One of the issues is you can only have one Windows Explorer button on the start, on the uh, taskbar. So if you wanted to have a shortcut to, you know, my to your documents folder, and you wanted to have a separate button on there for, you know, your music folder. Right. You can't do it. It, it yeah. puts them in the same in the, in the same button, and you, you can access them from the, the jump list. So, Keith, you know, I, I, we recommended a few weeks back uh, a way to work around that. There are other ways to work around it using different toolbars and stuff. I hate that kind of hokey stuff. But, you know, this is a need. You know, one of the things I'd like to do is have a couple of different folders in my, in my taskbar. Because I access them so much and I don't want to navigate through a bunch of folders and get to them. 
So Keith uh, wrote me this week and he said, you know, there is an easy way to do this. And it works like this. You basically create a shortcut to the folder that you want on the taskbar. You go into properties and in the target field, you'll see a path to that folder, whatever it is. It may be in quotes if there's a space. It may not if there isn't. You add the word explore to the front of it outside of the quotes if there are quotes. Just the word explore, space, and then whatever the path is. When you do this, the icon will change to the default Windows Explorer icon, but you can change it to whatever you want. Uh, There's a way to do that in that same dialog. But then you pin that shortcut to the taskbar. And you can do that as many times as you want, and you can have all different icons on there for all the different folders. And it totally works. Now, the only thing that it doesn't do is there's no uh, sort of custom jump list for that thing. No big deal. And when you do click on that shortcut, it actually, you know, the you get like a, a box around the icon, around the button that's in the taskbar mm -hmm. uh, to indicate that that thing is open. It doesn't occur on that folder. It occurs on the Windows Explorer icon. So that still is the place where you would have to go through the taskbar to get to it. But if you just want to launch it from the taskbar, this is exactly what I was looking for, uh, for example. So I have now a couple of these. I've created custom items for each one of them. And now instead of navigating through some complicated structure, I can just click on that thing and have the window open and be there. And I love it. And uh, I'm so glad you came up with this. If what I said doesn't make a lot of sense, because uh, <laughs> I rewind kind of and listen to it, it again. <laughs> well, or, um, or click the like. It you, will be you, on. It, by the way, it's going to be on my mailbag page on say, Sunday. Yeah, be on my page for the. That'll broadcast. make it easier if I can cut and paste the uh, yeah. command. Yeah. Cool. And finally, mm -hmm. the software pick of the week. Yeah. So again, I have two, and again, I guess I'm kind of blurring the line between tips and <laughs> the All software right. here, but. We, um, look, we, all, we like, love it all. I mean, we, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, how you all, it's all good. It. Yeah. It's all good. You know, but I, I went through the list. You know, I have a page on my site. I have all the podcasts we put up here. I have lists all the tips, all the oh, good. software. You know, and I went through that and I kind of looked at stuff. And uh, for me, uh, this, the software pick of the week is, is two things that are big deals for me. Uh, one is Microsoft Security Essentials. Yes. Uh, to me, this is a complete no-brainer. Huge. Yeah. It's obviously it's free and that's a big deal. But, you know, it's small, lightweight. And it doesn't get in your face ever. And I love that. Love it. You know, anyone who's ever used uh, Microsoft's previous security product, uh, OneCare, knows this thing used to pop up dialogues like it was spitting out chiclets. It was insane. <laughs> Hated it. Uh, and then other security Is it effective, suites, do you think? Is it as effective yeah, as other yeah. stuff? It's rated well. But, you know, I, I think that anytime you use a security, anytime you talk about security, uh, it's the human element that matters most in many yes. ways. And I think if you browse the web with common sense, uh, that's number one <laughs> line of defense. Um, but yes, I do think that uh, it's, it's enough. My kids use it on their computers. My wife uses it now on hers. And um, sure. one thing I do do with my kids' computers is I look at them from time to time because, you know, you want to make sure nothing nefarious is going on there. And so far, so good. And it has a nice Asian couple on the uh, website. Yeah, so Young, you got that. Going, right? Yeah, it's got that going for it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the other one, and this is absolutely crucial. And by the way, another thing I got my wife going on, going uh, with with her new computer, is LastPass. Um, and this is this came out of my desire to find some kind of a, an elegant password storer and a way to come up with uh, complex passwords that were secure. And there are, you know, there are kind of classic examples of this kind of software that run on the PC that are PC applications. But what I wanted was something that would store this stuff up in the cloud so that I could log on to it and then get access to it from any browser. And that's exactly what LastPass does. And this thing runs in all of the browsers now. Uh, up until the latest beta version of uh, Chrome, you had to use um, uh, kind of an awkward uh, interface for it. But now it's a full-fledged uh, extension, you know, because they support that in Chrome. And it works wonderfully, and I absolutely love it. And it is, you know, you talk about those things you always install when you install a new system. This is the... I. Well, I load the browser and then I download the browser I want. And then the next thing I do is I put LastPass on there. And it is absolutely ah, Me too. And, 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 and by the way, completely cross-platform, it works on everything, including my Droid and my iPhone. Yeah. yeah. Um, it is. It, I think you have to pay. I pay the buck a month. On the smartphone. And I do too, by the way. Yeah, well, that's worth, well worth it. It's, yeah, but I don't know what it's called. Pass, LastPass Pro or something. I, I do pay for it. It's yeah, fantastic. Premium. Yeah. Yeah. Love um, it. A buck a month. Come on. 
That's yeah. a no-brainer, you know. And I'm apps. glad they do the subscription because I want to support them because yep. they keep adding great features. Um, yep. I was talking with Steve well, Gibson. I said, I... these guys must be listening to you, Steve, because everything you recommend, they <laughs> add. They have oh, the Uberco, right? okay. yeah, 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 the perfect yeah. pasteboard passwords. Well, I mean, this is when just I, it. Yeah, when I got this, whenever it was, earlier in the year, they supported IE and Firefox. And, uh, you know, I use Firefox. It's fine. And I really wanted to get it going in Chrome. And for a while there, there was a... You had to use, uh, you had to create these buttons and use them in the bookmark, with the, like bookmarklets or whatever they call those. Right. And it wasn't as elegant, but at least it was a way to get it done. Oh, now it's and great. Then, and then it came out with the extension. I mean, the day one, uh, when Google came out with that version with extensions that were there, and it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And even even since then, by the way, it's improved literally since Chrome with extensions came yep. out. We're talking less than a month. That's why I'm, I'm perfectly glad to give them a buck a month because I'm getting yeah. a buck a month worth of value out of it. It's not. Oh, that's a, fair. It's, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. They, they. I don't know who these guys are. The only thing that worries me a little bit mm -hmm. is they're in Vienna, Virginia. Yeah, just down the road right. from the NSA. Actually, you know why that's a problem? Because that's actually very close to where Raphael lives. Ah, maybe it is Raphael. And speaking of people you can't trust with your personal data, yeah, man, that guy's a hacker. <laughs> hacker, man. No, these guys are really, really uh, uh, sharp and uh, have done a very, very good job and clearly know what they're doing, uh, which is kind of neat because they're um, they're geeks. And you can tell right. as they add the features that they – this is this is not – I mean, it works for mom, but it's not just for mom. It's for you and me. They put features in that, that you know, hardcore security yeah. geeks you can use. I, I Listen, as we increase our reliance on the cloud and so forth, this kind of thing is Gotta really have. absolutely critical. And you can't be using ABC123 as a password. <laughs> you know? No. Twitter, uh, Twitter nor, just nor banned that, you by the way. Use isn't? the same exact password on every single site. Right. Which is what people typically do. And and this this because this thing allows you to create long, secure passwords, and then you don't have to worry about what they are, you don't have to know. Right. Uh, it's yeah, it were it's fantastic. It's two for again, though, you've got another pick. I do. So this week's uh, software pick is it's called the uh Win7 Library Tool. I it was recommended to me by someone whose name I cannot pronounce. <laughs> so uh, if you uh, if you can see it there in list, Lars. Uh, no, like, sure, whatever uh, you say. <laughs> you can give it a shot if you'd like. Lars Ivan Bjortvet. There you go. Hello, Lars no. Ivan Bjortvet. Thank you for your <laughs> very nice contribution. Right. So why is this important? Um, one of the cool things about Windows 7 libraries is that you can aggregate content from different computers on your network. But... They have to be running the latest version of Windows Search, right? So if you want to do this with Windows Home Server, one of the features oh. in Windows Home Server PP3 is the integration with Windows Search 4.0 that allows you to do aggregate content from your home server down to the to your Windows 7-based PCs. Okay, fine. But what if you're accessing a, a network-attached storage that's not running Windows and there is no way to upgrade that thing to Windows Search 4.0 because it's running Linux or some right. proprietary thing? So what this add-on does is it allows you to add non-Windows NAS locations to your Windows Server libraries. A lot of people have network attached storage, right? They come with these little boxes. It's like a hard drive that, you know, instead of uh, connecting with a USB cable, it connects with a network uh, Ethernet cable to your home network. But you can't use it through Windows Server libraries, which kind of stinks. So a little utility here uh, that allows you to overcome that limitation, a classic um, kind of add-on for Windows if you need it. So it's a, it's a great little I'll solution. I'll have to try it, yeah. And it looks yeah. like it's free. Yeah, I think it's one of those um, donate-ware type of things. Give me a beer whatever. if you like me. Yeah. Paul, we've come to the end of a very uh, interesting uh, Windows 7, our New Year's edition. As we must. As we must. They all good things come to an end. We're going to let you go out. It's New Year's Eve as we record this you yeah. go to a party. So we don't go you... out. We, we do uh, we do fondue tonight. Oh, that's a great tradition. Yeah, and champagne with our friends. Oh, what fun! I might I yeah. might want to do that myself. You should stick a fork in it for me, would you? It's <laughs> it's kind of a I don't know what you call that thing we use. It's like a tine of some sort, with a little you know you. It's you a fondue poke. fork. What do you need another name for it? Isn't that what is it that is? What it's a, sure. it's, it's a, I guess well, I don't know. Let's look it up on Wikipedia. Do you do the? Do you do <laughs> if the... only there was some. Hmm. I told you that my son is a very small child. Said, "I wish there was some place <laughs> you could go and you could ask it a question and you would just find out the answer." You know, you're right though because the Swiss will never settle for you know fork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's going to have an Ikea the fondue type. pot is called the cacalon. Yeah, it's over a small burner which is called a réchaud. 
These are all very French words. Diners use forks to dip bits of food, most often bread, into the warm li semi-liquid sauce. <laughs> they so they said, but it says fork. It says fork. So for all these silly terms you just said, they actually use the word fork. Apparently. <laughs> Apparently. What do you, do you, are you a cheese or meat or a chocolate? We do, well, so we do three. So it's, che it's cheese to start with bread and then oil with different forms of meat yeah. and all kinds of sauces. And then at the end, you do fruit with chocolate. You, you, you have a triple fondue uh, thing. <laughs> it's a triple threat. That's right. It's a, you're a triple fondue threat. Yep. We don't eat this every week. It turns out it's not very healthy. <laughs> no, um, no, really. <laughs> so figure, uh, right. dipping bread in cheese and then meat and yeah, oil yeah, yeah. and then fruit and chocolate, that's not considered. Uh, not, there's no. fruit. There's fruit. So we kind of, we lube it up with champagne as well. You have to. That's. That's going to make sure it just doesn't poison. Yeah, you. you don't want it getting stuck in your intestines. Do you now? Just I'm curious. This fondue yeah. set that you have is this a wedding gift? Have you had it for many years? No. Oh, we've had it for a long, long time. Is and it even though is it burnt orange? <laughs> <laughs> I, I see where you're going with this, and uh, no, no, it's no? not. Is it avocado it's not green? From the set of the Brady Bunch? It's not. Oh darn! It's, uh, <laughs> it doesn't have flowers on it. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, does, it look, does it have the Swiss flag on it? You know, a little red no, cross. You no, know, no, no. I know it's stainless steel, and then oh. there's the um, the part that's uh, it's like a porcelain uh, part. For, yeah, that's yeah, your that's your cacalon. Yeah, your porcelain cacalon. Yeah, it's black, black. And oh, I'm getting yeah, hungry just thinking about that. I wish yeah, I were going to the. Thoracus. I've been starving myself all day for this reason, right? <sighs> Sounds we need, what we need is a vomitorium of sorts. So that <laughs> so we can eat more going, fondue. You know? What? Oh, God. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it just never stops. Oh. Good thing we're nothing like the ancient Romans. Nothing though. like them. <laughs> uh, uh, Emmentaler with a little kirsch. Yes. yes, that's right. Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah. It's really good. It is. It's awesome. It's not on my diet. Yeah. If I got fondue on my diet, it would be in a little, you know, Dixie cup. You know, maybe I could hop on this machine behind me after we're done. Of course, then my heart would explode and I'd be dead. So maybe I'll <laughs> there too. In the treadmill? Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. All right, Paul. Have a great time. Happy New Year. Thank you. All the best to you. We'll see you next week uh, at CES for a very yes. special Windows Weekly. See you then. Excellent show. Thank you, Saw. What are you doing for New Year's? Are you? Uh, oh, we're just going. Go uh, we have neighbors uh, up the hill. We live yep. in a um, a cul-de-sac where we know most of the people in the cul-de-sac, and the and the party seems to rotate around. So you don't yes. have to drive. It's nice because you just you walk yeah. over, and you can. And because they're uphill from us, when at the end of the party, I can roll downhill to my house. So it'll be really. <laughs> it couldn't be more convenient, really. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I plan to really just get wasted. Yeah, no, I'm. I'm yeah. Tomorrow's going to be an unhappy day. There's no doubt yeah, about it. I've, I've canceled all appointments. We have six six bottles of champagne coming. This I've told Frederick, hold my calls for the next yeah. 24 hours. All right, it's great to talk to you. Have a wonderful New Year. See you in Vegas. Okay. Bye-bye, Paul. Bye. -bye. Bye.